Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. I would like to welcome you all to the SCG Traveling Lecturer Symposium featuring the 2021 SCG Traveling Lectures. My name is Haleluya Ekanjo. I'm a PhD candidate with ICRAG at the University College Dublin, and I will be co-moderating today's event. For today's agenda, we'll first cover some logistics, followed by an overview of the SCG Traveling Lecturer Program, and then each lecturer will provide a 45-minute talk, followed by a live Q&A session. Today's call will be listened only for participants, but we encourage you to ask questions during each talk using the Q&A button in the control bar that should appear either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your setup. Questions on the presentations will be answered during the Q&A session following each talk. Today's event is being recorded and an archive will be available following the event on our website and on the SEG YouTube channel. The SEG is a professional society dedicated to the advancement, to the discovery and responsible development of mineral resources with members from all over the globe. We host several events throughout the year, including webinars, technical courses, and field trips. One of the items I'd like to highlight is a student field trip program, which is hosting a virtual trip to the Kalin and Cortez Trend in Nevada. The applications are due tomorrow, July 30th, so you still have some hours to send in your application. A lot of planning has gone into this event, so we are certain that this event will be a great learning opportunity for everyone. You can find out more information by using the QR code on your screen. As I mentioned before, I will be moderating today's event and I'll be joined by the amazing Joy Cutter from the University of Toronto. Today's speakers will include Mike Fenter, who is the SCG VP for Regional Affairs, Ross Sherlock, the SCG International Exchange Lecturer, Julie Rowland, the SCG Thai Linsley Visiting Lecturer, and Mike Robertson, the Regional Vice President Lecturer. With that said, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mike Fenter. As mentioned, Mike is a SCG Vice President for Regional Affairs. Mike is a consulting geologist with PhD Consulting. He has over 30 years of experience in the mining and exploration industries, covering a wide range of commodities at a corporate junior and private company as well as at consulting level. He is a registered professional with the South African Council for Natural and Scientific Professions, the SACNAF, and he is also a fellow of the Society of the Economic Geologists. Mike will provide an overview on the SEG Travel and Leisure Program. Mike, the floor is yours. Please take us away. Thank you very much. Hallelujah, um, and for the introduction. Um, I'd like to just to, um, and I'd like to thank um, Hallelujah and the SEG for organizing all of this, but I think it's very important for us to um, understand what, like who is the SEG because I know there's a lot of members and fellows who are listening to this uh, webinar, but um, we were founded in 1920, so we're a hundred year old centenary organization. Um, and essentially we were organized to establish to organize members who with interests in discovery, study and development of mineral resources to meet the needs of communities worldwide with three key objectives, which is advancing the science of geology uh, through investigation of our mineral deposits and mineral resources and disseminating these results through through various publications, webinars, meetings, conferences, just like we're doing now. And then of course, to advance the status of our profession globally. And I think that's very important to maintain a high professional ethical standard amongst our members. Uh, 2020 at a glance, um, as I said, SEG was founded in 1920. There's 5,800 members globally from 94 countries. Um, and we have a very strong uh, student component to our membership, which there's 111 student chapters in 31 countries. And um, coming from that is, um, you know, we provided half a million dollars of financial support to students through student grants, through our various student um, funding campaigns, as well as funding several field trips 
and virtual offerings. Um, I'd like to, oh, can I go back? Um, I'd like to mention the SAG mentoring program. Um, you know, based on the fact that we've got 5,800 members, um, we've got a lot of members and fellows who have a vast experience in mining, exploration, government, academia, um, across a lot of languages. Um, and we are here to to support and 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 provide advice to 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 ECP and and graduate students. Um, so that's something that I think it's very important as part of the SEG's um, outreach program. Um, and as I said, um, the SEG is is not just a US based organization. We have um, contacts and. Um, within your time zone, as you can see from Africa, Asia, Australasia, Europe, Mexico, and North Asia and South America. Um, these are VP, our regional VP presidents who are, have been elected to represent the SEG and all your representative um, jurisdictions. So please get hold of them. I know there's a lot of information here, but I know that this call is, uh, this um, presentation is being recorded. So please get hold of us. Just to touch on the SEG 100 uh, conference, um, it's a bit like the Tokyo Olympics. Um, um, we are celebrating our centenary a year later, but it is happening. It's virtual, uh, registration is open, everything is online, there is a physical presence. Um, those of you in Canada who and in the States can, can join it, um, please be there. But there are several themes and loads of themes to to um, and just to add, um, as part of um, part of the Whistler Conference, is the Student Early Career Program. Um, they have loads of different variables um, in terms of uh, Benedict Stein's lectures. Um, there's networking events and roundtable discussions, of which I think I'm in I'm in part of as well. So, so getting to tonight. Um, SEG traveling lecture program. Um, well, unfortunately, our lecturers can't travel very much, um, but they can still present the quality lectures that they have to offer you guys. Um, and they have been chosen. And as all our, our traveling lectures, being the International Exchange Lecture, which is Rush Luck for this year, the Thea Lindsley Visiting Lecture, which is Julie Rowland, and the Regional VP lecturer for Africa, which is Mike Robertson. Um, they've all been selected as each are every year. Um, these, these people have um, really contributed a lot to the field of economic geology. And um, they really are ambassadors to, to um, our society. So um, even though the the pandemic over the last two years has restricted their travel, so to speak. Um, I think that this virtual platform really provides a platform to, to ex extend their expertise and their lectures to, to everyone. And I think that's, that's fantastic. So there's a flip side to all of this. And uh, there's not only are we listening to three top class lectures for, uh, for this evening, or sorry, uh, for today, uh, but um, they do have other uh, lecture topics that they can be uh, that they can discuss and they can present. So more details are found on the SG website. So just in a nutshell, um, you've got three talks today. Uh, the first being Mike Robertson on emerging sediment hosted strata bound copper provinces in southern and central Africa, followed by Ross's Sherlock. Ross Sherlock's talk on gold endowment on the Superior Craton, mapping, predicting fertile fault systems, and Julie Rowland's talk on hydrologic magmatic technotic controls in hydrothermal flow, the Taupo Volcanic Zone, New Zealand, and implications for formation of earth vein deposits. So, you know, I think this is a, a truly global um, summary of talks. Uh, and really represents uh, what the SEG is all about. Um, we, we're talking about global um, 
economic geology. Uh, and I think there's so many applications and so many advancements that we can take out of these talks. So um, having said that, I uh, thank you and I and enjoy the talks. And if there's any questions that you have regarding to the SEG, please feel free to um, raise them right now. Thanks, Mike, for that update uh, from the SEG. Just a reminder to the participants, you can ask your question by submitting your question with the Q&A button in the control bar. And the attendees can see and they can also upvote the questions. Mike, we have one question for you here. It's from the SEG student chapters and they are looking to create collaboration in larger events with other chapters. The question is, should we involve regional VPs in this planning? Well, absolutely. Um, it all depends on, on, on where your chapter is based. Um, I, you know, um, as I said, we, we have a, a regional VP uh, in every jurisdiction in, on the planet. Um, so um, absolutely, um, the regional VPs are, are there. And I know that um, I, I flipped up the, 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 the contact details of the regional VPs quite quickly, but um, I, I do believe this, this, this presentation will be recorded. So um, yes, there is certainly collaboration. If there's any issue, please get hold of me. Thank you for that answer. And um, it does not look like we have more questions for you, Mike. So that's all we have for the moment. So thank you for that um, clear presentation that you just gave. Moving on, our next speaker is Mike Robertson. Mike is a principal consultant with the MSA group based in Johannesburg, South Africa. He has an MSc on the structural controls of gold mineralization at the Shiba mine in the Babaton Greenstone Belt. He has a particular interest in the application of applied structural geology to understanding controls on ore genesis and exploration targeting. This has led to work on orogenic gold deposits throughout Africa, Middle East, Western Australia, and Russia. He has been involved in mineral exploration both in industry and in a consulting role for 29 years. Apart from orogenic gold deposits, he has worked on a wide spectrum of mineral systems, including sediment-hosted stratabound copper and carbonate-hosted zinc lead in Southern and Central Africa, non-sulfide zinc in Turkey and Mexico, nickel copper PGEs in Canada, volcanic-hosted massive sulfide deposits in Eritrea and Saudi Arabia, and phosphate and bauxite deposits in Saudi Arabia. Mike believes that a fundamental geological understanding is a cornerstone to exploration success. Don't we all believe that? Mike is a SEG regional vice president lecturer who is selected by other regional vice presidents for their expertise in the field of economic geology. The lecturer provides talk to various organizations within their region. Selections for the lecture alternate among various regions each year. So Mike will be presenting his talk, Emerging Sediment Hosted Stradabound Copper Provinces in Southern and Central Africa. Mike, it's nice to see you again, and it's an honor to have you here with us tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hallelujah. Thank you for the introduction, and good morning. Good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are in the world. You can see the full screen there, I believe. Yes, looks great. Great stuff. Okay. Uh, thanks again for that introduction, and um, this is the title, as Hallelujah said, that's the title of my talk, um, and it's one of my key fields of interest at the moment, um, to, um, to there we go, sorry, this is an outline of the talk, uh, to start off, and um, just for context, I think we just have a, a brief look at the basic elements of the sediment hosted uh, start bound copper a deposit model just to set some context, both in terms of the classical sort of understanding, uh, but more importantly to just highlight some current thoughts which are driving exploration uh, currently. Uh, new insights around these deposits have come to light recently, um, specific mention being the um, excellent contributions during the, the Miley Symposium arranged by the SEG last year. Um, and this symposium centered on the current understanding of sediment hosted copper deposits and um, exploration strategies. Um, we'll then go on to look at um, sediment-hosted copper deposits in Central and Southern Africa, 
um, with an initial look at the global distribution of these kinds of deposits, um, then to concentrate briefly on the Central African Copper Belt as the, the benchmark sort of standard of this deposit type. Um, and then the main body of this talk really is on the Kalahari Copper Belt and the, the West Congo Copper Belt, which, um, which we see as really emerging copper provinces um, in the world today. But just briefly, I thought this is quite interesting just to put it into perspective. Um, and this is a graphic published in, in Resources in 2018, um, showing the different types of copper deposits in terms of size and grade, um, with size expressed as measured and indicated resources on the horizontal axis from um, 100,000 tons to around 10 billion tons, and copper equivalent grade on the vertical axis. Um, the contained copper is shown in these um, uh, sloping gray lines. So there's a variety of copper deposits that are shown here, from carbonatite hosted, orthomagmatic, porphyry, scarn, massive sulfide, disseminated, um, IOCG, vein type, and then importantly for us um, today is the sediment hosted um, section. So um, most copper deposits are, um, or the majority of production comes from porphyry systems, which is shown in the red um, diamond symbols here and the red um, outline. Um, and these deposits are generally large, but um, the grades ranging from around 0.3% to just under 1%. Uh, they tend to be well explored, but uh, it's sort of sub-economic at depth, uh, generally speaking. Sediment toasted copper deposits shown in the, the yellow diamonds here in the yellow outline, um, produce around a quarter um, of the current global copper production. So they're fairly significant, um, second after porphyry copper deposits. There are essentially two different types um, that were referred to throughout the talk, um, mainly sandstone or red bed type deposits, which have an average grade of around 1.6% and um, reduced fasci subtypes, which are higher grade at an average of about 2.6%. Um, important to mention as well, these um, sediment toasted deposits or copper deposits also contain important concentrations of silver and uranium. Um, and in the case of the Central African copper belt, um, they're host to the world's most important source of cobalt, supplying around 8% of um, the world's cobalt. In terms of the general model here, we see a schematic representation of the um, sediment hosted copper, or SSC, just abbreviated um, the model. This is sourced from the USGS um, and modified after Murray Hitzman's um, model published in 2010. So these deposits are typically hosted within um, Rift-related sedimentary basins um, in an intracritonic continental setting. Um, in general, the rift sedimentary sequences are underlain by mafic to bimodal volcanics, which you see in green here at the base of the of the rift. The overlying sediments form a thick, or kilometer scale, generally sequence of initially oxidized hematite-bearing immature siliciclastic rocks, known as red beds, which are shown here in brown. Um, and these red beds are overlain by um, fine-grained, typically um, reduced sediments of lacustrine to marine origin, which is shown in, in the gray unit here. Um, and these, the sequence is then overlain by, um, by marine carbonates, um, should an open ocean um, have developed within the rift system. These SSC deposits um, are shown in red here schematically, various uh, Parts of the model. Um, they're basically the product of evolving fluid flow systems on a basin wide and um, importantly on a sub basin scale as well, which we'll refer to repeatedly. Um, of importance are the red beds down here, which are permeable and therefore um, uh, act as aquifers and allow for the circulation of um, metal scavenging brines. Key requirements are a, a source of metals, obviously, source of metals and sulfur, transporting fluids pathways, um, uh, thermal or hydraulic pump to drive these fluids, and um, chemical and physical process to trap them um, in order for precipitation of copper to take place. Copper mineralization within these basins is typically hosted uh, within the lower most reduced horizons, um, and that is shown here, both schematically um, at the base of this gray unit here, and again up here, both interfaces redox boundaries with reduced systems, reduced um, units, I should say. Uh, mineralization is generally stratiform in nature, uh, but occurs both um, as disseminations and as veinlets. 
um, and may not be um, of economic grade. Your bodies tend to form thin sort of meter scale zones, which can form laterally extensive sheet like deposits or irregular to tabular deposits. Typically SSC deposits form near basement highs as you see shown here on the flanks um, of this model. Um, and also in association with basin margin growth faults, uh, see a number of these growth faults here um, that control the location of, of separate sub basins or hydrological um, compartments that are important for, for some of these deposits. And these faults basically act as conduits or, or can be sealed for all fluids escaping during basin compaction and uh, inversion. Just to look at these deposits um, in a global sense, um, where are they? And th this slide is from the USGS. and shows the global distribution of known sediment hosted copper deposits by type. Um, the main types really are red bed and reduced fasces types. Um, and as you can see, these deposits are, are found on pretty much every continent, but can vary significantly in terms of size and, and metal endowment. In terms of copper endowment, around 80% of currently known resources of this deposit type are located in the Central African Copper Belt in Zambia and the DRC, um, which is near Proto-Rizoke in age, um, followed by the Kupfer Schiefer in the Zechstein Basin in Northern Europe, that's Permian in age, um, and probably the third largest endowment um, is contained in the paleo Proto-Rizoic uh, Podar Udakon Basin in Russia. These three basins all contain supergiant deposits, which uh, contain over sort of 24 million tons of copper each. Um, highlighted also, and it's the subject of this talk, um, are emerging copper provinces, as I've turned them here, um, in the, being the Kalahari Copper Belt in Southern Africa and the West Congo Belt in the, the Western part of Central Africa. Just zooming into that region, um, South and Central Africa. Most of these deposits um, and the copper deposits and occurrences are shown here in the red symbols um, and includes all copper deposit types, not just um, the sediment hosted ones. Um, but from a, from a sediment hosted de deposit type, um, there's a clear association with these neoproterozoic basins, which is shown in the, the light blue color. And just highlighting those, um, and their association with neoproterozoic sequences. We see clearly the Central African copper belt here um, in Zambia and the DRC stands out as, um, or as head and shoulders basically above the rest. Um, this is the largest um, SSC province in the world um, with the DRC and Zambia representing the second and third largest copper producing um, countries globally. And it, just to put it into perspective, if we consider giant deposits of, of this type is containing more than 2 million tons of contained copper. There are um, approximately 28 such giant deposits in the world. And, and of those 28, 19 occur within the, um, the Central African copper belt here in, in the Katangan Basin. The other regionally important um, near Proterozoic um, provinces that host these type of deposits are the Damara down here. Um, and then obviously the Kalahari Copper Belt in Botswana and Namibia and the West, um, the West Congo Belt. The, uh, the Kalahari Copper Belt and the Central African Copper Belt share a similar tectonic history uh, with the key deformation being the Pan-African or, um, orogeny around um, 550 MA. And these are represented in the case uh, uh, of the Kalahari Copper Belt by the Damaran orogeny, which affected this whole region. Um, and the Lafillian orogeny in the case of the um, Central African Copper Belt. Just zooming in further, um, this is a map published by Lehman and others in 2015, basically covering Namibia here in the west and Botswana um, in the east, and uh, shows the Kalahari Copper Belt here in shades of red, uh, bordered to the south by the, uh, the Kalahari Craton to the south. Of importance to point out here, and we'll refer to it repeatedly, is the, the extent of cover here, which is the, the Kalahari group, um, which is this outline here, covering about two thirds of this whole region. Um, and that Kalahari copper belt basically comprises semi consolidated to unconsolidated sufficial deposits um, of uh, basically of sands. And the photo on the lower right just gives you a, a kind of a taste for the typical terrain within this region. This is a photo from Botswana, it was also on the title site. 
and just shows the extent of the sort of sand cover uh, by way of example. The basin hosting this Kalahari copper belt is uh, Miso to Neoproterozoic in age and was formed um, within a northeast southwest trending intracratonic rift, which is now represented by a forward thrust belt. The, the belt is approximately 1,000 kilometers long and up to 250 kilometers wide and extends from the, the central or from the Sinclair region here in southern Namibia right through to, to northeastern Botswana. The belt represented the foreland uh, to the Damara Basin to the north over here, which is near Proterozoic in age and basically the time equivalent of the Katanga Basin. Um, just to point out here, um, the Hanzi Ridge, uh, which is the darker red zone there, um, that is a discontinuous, approximately four to 500 kilometer long sort of structural high or structural window. Um, that is overlain by thinner cover and it's, it's basically formed the, the focus for a lot of the exploration and mine development that's taking place there purely because there's, there's less cover and um, the prospective units are more closer to surface. Just uh, zooming in there on the, on, the, on the actual Kalahari copper belt per se, um, this is also sourced from the USGS and shows the more important copper deposits within the belt. Um, in the Namibian section to the west here, um, is Klein Arb, um, just to point out a few of them, Ometes, important copper silver deposit mined in the past, uh, Kuperberg, there's a couple of photos of that later on, um, as is for, for Malachite Pan and this cluster of deposits here in sort of East Central Namibia. In Botswana, just to, there's a whole cluster of deposits, but just to point out two, the Zone 5 deposit, which is under construction currently by uh, Kupri Canyon Capital, and um, the T3 Matia deposit um, of sand fire resources, which um, it just, um, obtained a mining license for. This is quite an interesting slide, and it is uh, sourced from or put together by Kalahari Metals a couple of years ago. Um, and I put it in here because it just shows the, the exponential increase in exploration activity and resource definition um, since the 1960s. Um, and basically shows along the horizontal axis here, time in decades from the 1960s to, to the present. Um, and the vertical axis is, is copper equivalent, contained. Um, just to point out the Klein Arb mine in the previous slide that was um, a mine operating in Namibia from um, 1966 to 1987, uh, produced 7.5 million tons, 2% copper and 50 grams of silver. Um, and there are other known deposits in, um, uh, in Namibia, but basically it started off in Namibia um, and that led companies to extend their regional copper exploration programs into Western Botswana in the late 1960s and 1970s around here. Um, at that point in time, that part of Botswana was a real backwater in terms of access and infrastructure um, with exploration challenged by the remoteness of that region um, as well as the sand cover, which we, we pointed out earlier. Um, and also, you know, at that time, the Central African copper belt was um, sort of coming into favor with basically booming. And um, this region in Botswana and Namibia compared pretty much unfavorably with, um, with the higher grade deposits that were being um, discovered and exploited up in Zambia and the DRC. The understanding of the, the geology structure and mineralization has been advanced um, lately um, in uh, not only through exploration activity, but also through research. And just to point out in particular, um, two PhD studies, one by Wesley Hall um, on the Botswana side and um, Sarah Jane Gill on the Namibian side. Those are, are recent PhDs that have looked at the, the controls on mineralization and have greatly added to our understanding of the controls of mineralization uh, within the belt. And then also, as mentioned previously, the Mwali Symposium last year really brought to, to, to the fore the uh, current thinking on, um, on controls and the genesis of um, deposits within this belt. Um, sorry, just to go back. So just to point out in the last 10 to 15 years, this exponential increase in um, discovery and resource definition within the Kalahari uh, copper belt that really is exponential and a lot of that has been driven by my new data specifically um, high resolution airborne magnetic data 
um, uh, through government surveys in Namibia and Botswana, um, and compiled in the following slide by, by Lehman. This is also from that same publication by Lehman in 2015. And um, if, you, if you remember back to that slide of the cover, you know, most of this area is covered to, um, with the best, very sparse outcrop. This airborne mag um, imagery has, has greatly, um, has, well, has really been a game changer in terms of our understanding of, of stratigraphy and structure. What is otherwise a fold and thrust belt that's largely concealed beneath, beneath the younger Kalahari cover. The differences in the magnetic response between the various stratigraphic units um, has allowed for detailed geological interpretation to be made, um, as well as detailed, detailed structural interpretation. Um, and this new understanding has basically been um, uh, a driver for, for exploration, for recent exploration targeting beneath cover. Okay, this is a similar field of view to the previous slide, and um, this is taken from, from Hall's, uh, Wesley Hall's PhD thesis in 2017. Um, and it basically shows his lithostratigraphical and structural interpretation of the magnetic data. Um, his study also involved the implications of this for copper silver mineralization. And um, the interpretation basically reveals a, a complex fold and thrust belt um, with a target horizon is. Um, it's both laterally extensive and duplicated through this, this folding and thrusting. At the bottom left here, um, we see the stratigraphic sequence. Uh, the nomenclature is different. This is the Namibian nomenclature, and this is the, the Botswana um, uh, stratigraphic nomenclature, but they're showing the correlation really between the two. The lower image, uh, lower image on the right here is basically a section, a north-south section, which shows schematically this quite upright folding that we see throughout the belt, um, which is which is basically southeast version. Um, some of these folds, a lot of them are doubly plunging, as you see here, um, through, through two periods of folding. And that's an important um, uh, feature from an exploration targeting point of view in that it um, brings these deposits potentially closer to surface. In Botswana, the, um, and this stratigraphic column is from uh, Wesley Hall's presentation at the Mwali Symposium last year. Um, the Hanzi group, shown in the red outline here, um, is underlain by volcanics, which is the, at the bottom of the rift here. The Cuevia formation of volcanics, shown in orange here, um, and that forms the base of the sequence, which is overlain by this metasedimentary sequence, basically uh, conglomerates and um, core sediments at the base. Um, Overlain by the Nguaco Pan, which is a thick red bed sequence up to three and a half thousand meters thick, um, deposited in a, in a sort of a rift environment. Um, that is overlain by this unit in green, which is your Dakar formation, um, which represents a reduced fasces, siliciclastic carbonate sequence deposited in a marine to, to lacustrine envir environment. Um, and that represents the Dakar formation, represents a significant um, transgressive event within the basin. And just important to point out the base there, as is annotated, the basal portion of that uh, Dakar formation is the principal host to uh, copper silver deposits within the belt um, and represents um, the, the first, the real, really the first reduced horizon within the sequence. The overlying Mamuno formation uh, is a 1500 meter thick plastic sequence. Um, which we'll see photos of later uh, or just now. Um, so the following slides just give an idea of what the, the region looks like and some of the rocks as they are exposed here and there. This is a view looking, looking south basically, um, midway along the Hanzi Ridge, which I pointed out earlier, and shows the typical scenery, which is pretty flat. Um, so although exposure is not great, you do see um, these sort of subtle low amplitude ridges um, that trend northeast southwest. We're actually standing one on one in the foreground. Um, there's another one in the um, central part of the of the image there. Um, and these just hint at the, the underlying geology that sort of northeast southwest trending belt. That is the um, uh, from a similar uh, perspective looking southeast normal to stratigraphy um, standing on the car formation sort of argillaceous rocks. Um, and looking across to these hills in the background, 
which are um, volcanics and form the, the highest topography by far in, in the region. So if we just um, look at those volcanics in more detail, this is what they look like. Um, they're basically um, rhyolites with, um, which uh, have a strong sort of um, sub-vertical to southeast verge and foliation. So this photo is basically looking um, northeast along strike. And then just looking sort of in closer detail is a pencil with scale there. They're basically porphyritic rhyolites um, with, with plagioclase phenocrysts. And um, yeah, these are some of the most prominent outcrops within the region. Uh, and then it's okay. So those were the um, Quebe Formation Volcanics. Um, we're now gonna have a look at, um, at the Hunzi group um, sedimentary rocks. And um, this is a, your sort of typical um, bush track um, across the Hanzi group rocks and um, very little outcrop, but here and then you, you here and there you see float and it does give a, you know, you, you do get a good indication of the underlying geology. But just to point out here, again, these subtle sort of very low amplitude ridges, northeast, southwest trending that, that allude to the underlying geology. Um, and it's not only the, the, the topography, which is which subtly shows the geology, the vegetation does as well. Um, on the right, you see these um, broadleafed um, tree felt, which basically overlies the, the red beds. Um, and then the thorn trees or thorn felt, which overlies um, the Dakar formation more you reduce sequences. So um, that does also give a clue to the, to the underlying geology. Just having a look at the, the Nguaka Pan formation, this is, um, uh, a roadside outcrop of steeply dipping sandstone of the Nguaka Pan formation that's exposed on the limb of a fold. So um, this is all sort of very steeply to sub vertically dipping. Um, and this photo is taken also in the kind of that central part of the Kanzi Ridge area. The, um, these sandstones form um, uh, a monotonous sequence of gray to, to red beds, um, poorly sorted and uh, with plenty of sedimentary structures as well. This is just an example of, of um, cross bedding um, that's, that's exposed in these sort of steeply dipping subvertical um, sandstone beds and um, some well-preserved wave ripples as well. So some really interesting um, sedimentary structures that are quite well-preserved. This is an example again of Nguaku formation, uh, Nguaku pan formation, sorry, your sort of typical red beds, uh, pretty much planar bedded here. Um, and uh, that's basically with your underlying sort of um, aquifer or red beds of sequence below the Dukar formation. Just to go back to the stratigraphic column, um, we'll now have a look at some examples from the Dukar formation. Um, and this is also from a, from a roadside cutting, but the only exposures in, 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 in the area. Um, the Dakar Formation comprises a sequence of reduced mudstones, milestones, siltstones, um, and some minor limestones. Um, and as we said previously, it's the basal part of this formation that's the main host to your copper silver deposits in the region. Um, and also just to point out here, the sort of iron oxide staining, um, fairly typical and, and probably after, after sulfides. Th this is another example of the Dukar formation, um, sort of this, this very strong foliation or cleavage, and this sort of pavement exposure of, um, of Dukar formation. And as you note here, very little in the way of Kalahari sand cover or, uh, or even soil development. And then at the top of the sequence, you've got your Mamuno formation, um, which we'll have a look at, um, a couple of examples of that. Um, this photo is taken near the Namibian border within the Kalahari belt, um, and is a small quarry within the Mamuno formation. Um, also gives, a, a, again, an impression of the pretty flat um, topography within the, within the region. Just having a closer look um, here again, in this instance, um, very little in the way of cover, um, with Mamuna formation um, sandstones exposed in this dry riverbed. And if we have a closer look at that, um, these outcrops are within a few meters of each other and vary from sort of this flat bedded sandstone through to gently dipping. So you do get an idea through a traverse of the, the extent of folding, you know, even on a, on a small scale like this. 
and that is the typical sort of Namuno formation um, uh, sandstones, or well, they're actually quartzites because they're, they're quite silicious here. Um, but an important feature um, of this unit or this formation is the purple color, um, and it's quite characteristic. And you see it in the asphalt road surfaces as well, they crisscross the region where this material has been widely used for, for road construction. And just to further emphasize the topographical aspect, this is quite, quite interesting. This is the Aqua Valley, um, uh, even signposted, and it's one of, the, one of the more prominent topographical features in the region. It's located just south of the town of uh, Kanzi. So this is a valley in a, in a Botswana context. And just to across the border in Namibia, just to give examples of what um, what these lithologies look like there. Um, as we pointed out previously, the, this eastern part of Namibia is largely covered by, by Kalahari group sediments. Um, just to there are a couple of examples of lithologies here, this one, and, and these are photographs taken from Mike Fenter during a site visit in 2011. Um, the top right photo is um, from the Malachite pan deposit over here um, with an old trench in the foreground. Um, at Malachite Pan, it's a little bit different to the deposits in Botswana in that um, you have multiple zones of um, multiple thin zones of copper mineralization, which are primar primarily hosted in green um, uh, siltstones and argillaceous rocks. The photo on the lower right is from the Kuperberg um, deposit, which uh, highlighted earlier, situated over there. Um, and this shows secondary copper. Malachite and, and chrysocolla staining on fracture and, and bedding surfaces. And um, as, as with Malachite Pan and Klein Arb, and with a number of these uh, deposits in Namibia, the copper mineralization takes the form of a series of, of stacked mineralized argillite units. So a little bit different, as I said, from the, um, from the Botswanan style. And then just to add on this, this whole region of the, the Kalahari copper belt in Namibia is seeing renewed exploration activity um, at the moment. Um, there's an Australian company who has a large land holding there who are about to embark on a large scale drilling program after about a, a 10 year hiatus in, in exploration activity. Um, this is the, the Okusewa project, um, also photos taken by Mike Fenter. Um, the Okusewa prospect is close to Malachite Pan, but just to give you an idea of the kind of lithologies we're looking at, um, sort of fine reduced marls and um, um, graphitic shales. Um, at Okusewa, mineralization takes the form of disseminated, um, uh, widely disseminated chalcopyrite and chalcosite. Uh, you probably can't see it there, but the arrows do point to this disseminated sulfide mineralization. Um, and then also to point out this sort of scale, the, or this tight folding you see even on a, on a core scale, um, which basically indicates that you see it on a fractal uh, kind of system uh, or scale, I should say, from regional scale folds that are tens of kilometers along right through to similar structures on a, on a micro scale like this. In terms of the mineralization controls, um, this slide just summarizes some of the main uh, features and main controls. Uh, just to point out that copper silver mineralization within the belt is developed over about a thousand kilometers, um, basically from the old Sinclair mine in, in western or southwestern Namibia, right through to northeastern Botswana. Um, and as a general rule, um, these deposits or this mineralization is spatially associated with the first reduced um, horizon that we find in the sequence. The deposits are relatively thin. Um, generally, generally, you know, in the meter scale, uh, but quite continuous laterally, you know, but typically between one to four kilometers um, lateral extent. And essentially, two main styles of mineralization are developed, um, classic uh, strata bound disseminated and sulfide veinlets, and I think this was the main target for, for historical exploration uh, in the past. Um, but the second type, which has really come more to the fore and is often associated with higher grade zones, um, is structurally controlled mineralization, which has really just been a, um, um, a result of recent understanding. And uh, the structural controls really relate to, to basin inversion during the, during the Dameron orogeny. 
a paleotopography is also important, um, particularly from a point of view of, um, of basement highs. And we'll look at an example shortly on that. Um, and then just some more points on the structure, in particular, um, the early basin architecture and associated growth faults um, are very important really in identifying um, sub-basin controls on the distribution of structures and mineralization. Um, we, these features form in um, hydrological compartments and um, an understanding of that greatly helps the exploration targeting. Permeability is also important from a point of view, obviously with the underlying red bed aquifer, um, as well as on a more local scale with coarser beds, um, alternating coarser beds and reduced um, fine grain beds like we see in the Namibian deposits. Just briefly on a, and this is a, a schematic model put together by mod resources before they were taken over by, by sand fire resources. And um, it's similar to the model we saw, we saw earlier. Um, it's basically um, fluids have inferred to have migrated through these sort of basal red bed um, sequences shown in pink red here, um, along basin margin faults at the margins of the basin and precipitated um, copper silver mineralization within the, at this redox interface here um, at the base of the um, Dakar formation, which represents, as we said, the, the first reduced horizon that we come to. The graphic on the right here illustrates some of these secondary structural controls, uh, which we'll talk about more later with some examples um, and features such as um, stacked mineralized zones related to this folding, as well as fracture and, and shear zone hosted mineralization. And um, this basically highlights um, some of the recent thinking that is driving exploration targeting currently, um, such as understanding the original, a better understanding of the original basin architecture, and um, as well as later or subsequent structural controls that may have modified that mineralization. And uh, some of these features may, may not have been um, understood or as well appreciated in the past. So they really are fundamental to the to current exploration. Uh, these graphics and the photograph of the core here is taken from a Hall's presentation last year in, at, at the Mali Symposium. Um, and the reason for including it is he, he just, um, he, he brings to light here the, the amount of flexural slip that you see during folding, um, of the, during the tight folding and thrusting that produces bedding parallel veins that you see here schematically um, and in core down here um, that are linked by um, cross-cutting tension vein arrays um, and that, that sort of link these dominant bedding parallel veins. And um, through, through re reactivation and synkinematic mineralization um, that's really led to, to several phases or stages of um, veining having been recognized. To look specifically now at, at, at three examples of, of structural controls and mineralization, uh, we look at these three deposits. Um, firstly, the Zeta, uh, Zeta Northeast, um, which is, uh, and this is again a slide from, from West Hall, um, but it really, really emphasizes quite nicely the um, the controls that, that we've been talking about. And um, what we see here is the, the second vertical derivative of the, the magnetic data um, with the Kwebe formation volcanics shown here uh, with a high magnetic signature forming a, a kind of a basement dome. And that is flanked by a quieter magnetic signature on the flanks uh, that represents the Nguaco Pan red beds, um, which onlap onto the, the, the sort of basin or basement um, volcanic dome um, for me sort of wedge shaped um, sedimentary uh, features. So in G basically Hall interpreted the magnetic imagery from, uh, from this geophysical surveys together with detailed information from, from drilling in this area um, and has identified what is previously unknown, but importantly um, thinning of these units against the, um, the, against the sides of the basement dome and then erosion of that um, Nguaco Pan formation prior to deposition of the, um, of the Dakar formation, which is shown there. And that typically the Dakar formation has um, associated with a, um, sort of parallel magnetic highs 
And um, I think it's important to point out that this, this magnetic contrast between the Rocco Pan and the uh, Dakar Formation is a very important, or forms a very important marker um, a feature for, um, for mapping the, the redox contact uh, throughout the belt. Uh, these are the actual deposits, zeta over there. So there's a scale two kilometers. So zeta is about four kilometers in, in strike extent, and zeta northeast, um, basically related or spatially related to underlying basement highs uh, formed by this, um, this the volcanics, um, together with focusing of fluids through this thinning red bed sequence, um, until the, and probably also along basin margin growth faults. Um, until those, flow, those fluids reach the, um, the, the base of the Dakar Formation where the copper was precipitated. Um, and to look briefly, our second example is from the banana zone over there. Um, this is an interesting example also from, from Holt's talk last year. Um, it shows what is referred to as the Northeast Fold um, on the banana zone anticline and is a great example of structurally controlled mineralization in that we have not one, but four stacked um, mineralized horizons with two in the Dakar formation and two in the sort of the upper Rocco Pan formation. Um, that's underlain by, by, by breccias within the sort of more competent Rocco Pan, with Rocco Pan red beds. Um, and this basically forms these, these saddle reefs, which uh, importantly are also higher grade, um, with sort of dilation or veining. Um, and the advantage here as well is that with this, this folding is that these, these mineralized units then are, um, are more amenable, being shallower, more, more amenable to, to open pit mining. One of the challenges within the, the Kalahari copper belt historically has been one of grade um, with an average grade of about 1.3 to 1.4% copper. Um, you know, that didn't really compete too well with, with the Zambian copper belt at the time, which has a grade about double that. Um, but what, what we've been seeing is that the, the structurally controlled mineralization is often associated with higher grade zones, um, which obviously forms a, is, is important from an uh, exploration targeting point of view. The last example is the A4 deposit, which is Sandfire Resources, um, uh, which is also currently in uh, undergoing development. And this is a slide from uh, a press release uh, put out by, by Sandfire late last year. Um, and it's a bit of a complicated slide, but just to point out in the background here, um, secondary, second order folding um, on the limb of a, of a sort of a regional anticline and um, that these second order folds are cross cut by shear zones, um, which have resulted in extensional sort of sub horizontal extensional vein arrays that are mineralized. So we have sort of stacked mineralized layers um, related to extensional veining as well as shear hosted mineralization. So um, again, within, and this is a, an outline of their um, the optimized pit shell. So conveniently really within fairly shallow and um, within open pitable um, mining. Okay, so much for the the, the Kalahari copper belt. Um, I just want to touch briefly on the on the other province that um, uh, that is the subject of this talk, and that's the West Congo belt. Um, and then just zooming in to that, um, that is just a, a basically the what's shaded there is the Neoproterozoic basin outline, um, and the known copper deposits and occurrences are shown in the red symbols. Um, and just zooming in further, this is basically the geology of the central part of that um, West Congo belt. Um, and what we have here, I won't we'll just uh, dwell on it briefly, um, but it's basically a fold and thrust belt that extends um, northeast southwest. If we just go back to, to this slide, um, from, from basically southern Gabon through the Republic of Congo, to the western extent of the DRC and into northern Angola. So that's a distance of about 1400 kilometers. And what we're looking at here is the, the central part of that belt, which is, um, which is the widest. Um, and it's basically a fold and thrust belt that's northeast virgin. Um, uh, what we have is Paleoproterozoic basement, which is the, um, 
chemesian here, which is this pink unit shown here in, in plan and in section. Um, that is basement, which is Paleoproterozoic, and that is overlain by your Neoproterozoic um, basin, which comprises the, um, we won't go into detail, but basically the Zidinian, Mayumbian, and West Congolian um, groups, which form most of what we see here on the map. Um, so just to go back to that. Um, so the, the Western part is fairly uh, intensely deformed and metamorphosed. As, and, and as we go towards the, the sort of Northeast, um, this, the West Congolian group here in blue is pretty much undeformed and unmetamorphosed, but it's this unit that, um, that is associated with the, the copper mineralization. Uh, just to give you a feel before we have a look at that, um, of, of, the, of the scenery and access, this is the main road from the coast heading east um, through that uh, Paleoproterozoic basement, the Chemesian basin, basement. Um, and that, um, just as an aside, is very prospective for gold. Um, here we see a road cutting of uh, graphitic sheared, um, graphitic argillaceous rocks that are cut through by quartz veining, lots of sulfide staining and so on. So very juicy from a gold point of view. Um, and then as we head further east into the, the basin, um, this area underlain by the West Congolian group, this is typically what it looks like, sort of very really flat to, um, to undulating. And these are your typical rocks, just examples. Exposure isn't great at all, but these are just some examples, um, similar to what we saw for the Kalahari copper belt, underlying red bed sandstones, um, and then mudstones. And then as you get up in the sequence into the, um, West Congolian belts, you have these reduced carbonates that um, are associated with much of the mineralization. And just to have a, a brief look at, at mineralization and the extent thereof, um, it's basically uh, copper, zinc, and lead, copper dominant, but um, sort of multi, um, multi element. And this shows the, the extent of known deposits and occurrences. Um, just importantly to point out, most of the, the known occurrences are, are in the central part of the belt um, and associated with the so-called um, Sanger Olacogen, which sort of trends northeast. And if we just zoom into that area, um, this just shows this is the Republic of Congo and this is the published metallogenic map. Uh, just to point out, this is the Paleoproterozoic Basin basement. And these are most of this is sort of gold occurrences, as mentioned previously. But the overlying um, basin, um, all of this is here, and if you can see, but that is, these are all copper occurrences that have mapped out mainly during um, colonial times. Um, and since then, there's been very little modern systematic exploration in this entire region. Most of the, the known deposits are, are clustered here. Um, around the Brazzaville is there just for, for context and Kinshasa across the other side of the river. Um, so we have about an 80 kilometer long zone of uh, at least half a dozen deposits that have been mined historically, uh, copper, zinc, and lead um, that have been mined out and I think were last mined in, in like the, the 80s. And those are all associated with um, uh, fault structures or rift margin structures related to that the lackage that we pointed out earlier. Um, the, Mineralization there, um, I don't have any photographs of it, but it's very similar. If we pop across onto the DRC side, there's a deposit called a Mamba Kalenda, um, about 70 k's from, from Kinshasa, that um, is very, very similar to what we see in the Republic of Congo. Um, and I've got some photos of core later on. Uh, but just to point out, these deposits are quite small, about 11, 12 million tons, but they're reasonably high grade. And uh, there's another one in Northern Angola here. Um, Voyo Titelo, um, also sort of similar tonnages and, and similar grades. And um, from an exploration point of view, um, this region is very much underexplored. Um, and there's no reason why, I mean, this is looking at the other side of this lacogen, why we don't see um, a mirror image of the scale of deposits that we see on, on, in the Republic of Congo. Um, I think it's purely because there's been so little exploration Contacted here. Um, and these are 
uh, our slides of core from Mbamba Kalenda, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. Um, again, the mineralization associated with redox interface, um, um, as well as the sort of rift margin fault structures that have been reactivated. So the combination of that sort of stratigraphic interface um, cut by these faults forms um, sort of linear zones to, just to, to put it simply, at Bamba Kalenda, you've got a sort of a linear zone of high grade secondary copper mineralization that extends for about five kilometers and is open ended. Um, so here you get an idea of the style of mineralization. It's, it's all secondary. We're looking at about 150 meters depth here. Um, and with sandstones to the left and um, reduced carbonates to the to the right, and if we have a closer look at the, the mineralization, it's um, as I said, it's all secondary, um, massive chalcosite and malachite. Um, but as we said previously, not only copper, um, we find zinc and lead associated with this as well. There's a whole combination um, together with com a combination of other elements, um, such as vanadium and arsenic and, and germanium. Um, this particular uh, photo is taken, I think, from the next cool tray below that um, the previous one, and what you see here is secondary um, zinc oxide or non-sulfide zinc mineralization, in this case, willemite that's uh, coating these fracture surfaces um, in this instance. So real high grade um, uh, deposits. And um, uh, I, I think the, the exploration potential here is significant in that it's been very, very little work done um, you know, since basically since colonial times. In summary, therefore, there's um, uh, currently a strong exploration focus on both um, the Kalahari copper belt down here and the West Congo belt, um, both of which um, have been very much underexplored in the past uh, compared, especially when you compare it to, um, to the Central African copper belt and even the Damara um, belt here in Namibia. And um, with, um, with copper prices near all-time highs at the moment and predicted supply shortfall um, predicted for the next few years at least, it's very likely that we're going to continue to see increased exploration activity and, um, and new discoveries in these two belts with, um, with time. But thank you very much for your, for your attention. Mike, that was a brilliant talk, and I am sure the interest of these emerging provinces from both academia and industries has gone up. So thank you for that talk. So now we'll be moving on to the Q&A session. As a reminder, please do submit your questions in the Q&A tab, and I will be sure to pass them on to Mike. Uh, Mike, we have one question for you here. The question goes, what conditions allow for the Zeta chalcosite zones in the Kalahari belt to be so unique in terms of having 47 million tons at 6% copper? This seems about three times average in the area. Mike, over to you. Sorry, um, hallelujah. Sorry, that was put in the Kalahari copper belt. Yeah. At 6%. I'm not sure which, um, I'm not sure exactly what deposit that refers to. Um, you know, the average grade there just across a belt scale is about 1.3, 1, 1. 1.4%. And the higher grade zone, such as zone five, which is about 100 million tons at 2%, um, those are some of the highest grades that we see. So I'm not aware of anything that, um, in my knowledge, that, that that's higher grade than that. But there might, there might well be, you know, within these structurally controlled zones, um, uh, sort of isolated or, or localized um, deposits or instances where you have um, higher grade, higher grade deposits. Thanks, Mike. Um, and just um, a quick uh, reminder, we do see some hands being raised. So if you do have a question, please put it in the chat box and I will be sure to pass it on to Mike. Uh, Mike, there's another question for you here. Um, your chart showed that discovery rates in the Kalahari belt have been increasing. Is this a result of more exploration companies and dollars or better methods in use for exploring under all of the cover or is it a combination of both? Yeah, I'd say pr pretty much um, both, both, but more importantly, the, the latter in terms of new understanding, you know, as you mentioned, um, and new tools for exploration 
uh, I think driven basically by that the great magnetic data that's available at sort of 200 or 250 meter line spacing. Um, and then on top of that individual company surveys at even better resolution. So that's really been a game changer in terms of understanding the belt. Um, but also in terms of exploration technology, um, EM electromagnetic surveys have been instrumental also in, in mapping out that the contact between the, the Ngwaka Pan and the Dakar formation with the Dakar formation being much more of a conductor. So EM is able to, has been able to, to map that out quite successfully in certain instances. Um, and then from a, being able to see through cover point of view where you have, where the cover is thicker, um, sort of new current um, geochemical methods such as uh, partial leach MMI, that sort of geochemistry that um, um, is able to, to see through cover, through sand cover, I think that's also added great value and understanding in terms of, um, uh, of sort of fingerprinting or fingerprinting or generating exploration targets. Brilliant. Thanks for that answer, Mike. Um, I have one last question for you here. It says, in the West Congo Belt, what is the grade and the mineralogy of the hypogen zones? Okay. What in, I know for a fact that in Bamba Kalenda, we don't see hypogen zones. Um, it's all secondary. Um, you know, basically like what we saw, you know, chalcosite, um, malachite, cuprite, and other kinds of secondary copper minerals. I do understand that that on the um, the Republic of Congo side, with that full string of deposits that we pointed out, that there is hypergene mineralization associated with that. Um, you know, in in the form of bornite, um, uh, bornite chalcopyrite, pyrite, um, that has been mined historically. But um, I believe also that a lot of the well, most of the historical mining was focused on the higher grade supergene um, components of that. Um, as to what what remains there, I'm not too sure. I know that there were there have been companies look looking at that uh, part of the the belt in Republic of Congo, um, uh, sort of on and off. But I'm not aware of what what current exploration activity is is being conducted there and what what is remaining there in terms of um, resources, particularly perhaps for unmined hypergene um, resources. Brilliant. We have more questions coming in. Um... What is the source of the oil fluid at the Kalahari copper deposits and is it structurally controlled? Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting aspects is the fact that um, a, a, most of these belts worldwide are, well, obviously copper domi dominated, um, but also have associated silver. Um, and uh, the exception is the, uh, the Central African copper belt, we have cobalt associated as well. So I think that, that's a reflection of source. Um, so I think there are there are a number of possibilities. You know, in my view, um, you could have the actual red beds themselves as being a, a source uh, of the stripping of metals from this very thick package, you know, three to four kilometers of underlying red beds, uh, stripping of metals there by um, by ore fluids, by, by basin or brines. Um, and then there are, within the underlying volcanics, there are records of um, copper occurrences within the underlying volcanics as well that, um, that could also have been a, a source for, for copper that we now see in the, um, up in the, the Dakar Formation. Thanks for the answer, Mike. The last question that I have here is, are there any other metals in the Kalahari copper belt other than copper and silver? If not, might this be because it's lack of analysis being done for other metals or what, how can, how can you answer that question, Mike? Um, yeah, it's, um, I've recently become aware that there were a couple of papers written on it, uh, that there are, um, people have done work on platinum group metals that are, um, associated with with some of these deposits in the Kalahari copper belt. Um, that's about as much as I know. Um, I've actually sourced these, but I haven't gone through them in detail. But you know, there is some research being done into PGMs associated with, with some of these deposits, which I think is a that's something new that's just uh, recently been um, you know brought to, to to our attention. But apart from that, 
um, they are basically, as far as I know, um, the, the copper and, and silver dominated. Brilliant. Moving on to the next question. Has biogeochemistry been used to explore in zones with transported sand? Um, I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure it would have been tried in the past. I'm not aware of, um, of any specific examples, but, you know, particularly because, you know, the challenging environment that we find ourselves in there, you know, in terms of sand cover, which varies in thickness, you know, anything from, from nothing to 200 meters, that there been various, um, you know, sort of exploration tools applied to try and see through that. And um, uh, as I said, I'm not aware of any specific examples, but I'm sure that somewhere along the line, there has been some um, sort of biogeochemical work that's, that, that has been done there. That um, It's an interesting question that, um, that, 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 that I look into. Uh, Mike, you will have to stick with us for a bit more. We have some questions coming in. Uh, the next question says, some of your dual core photos of red col coloration, oxidation, and redox indication looked like rocks above Olympic Dam deposit. Can you comment on what might be some of the Australian giant similarities to Kalahari and Kinshasa typical or deposition environment and surrounding rocks? Yeah, I can't um, I can't comment too in my, too much detail at all on that. Other than um, my understanding is that that Olympic Dam, the original exploration there, was focused on, um, if I'm not incorrect, on sedimentosed copper deposits. That was the, the original model that was applied there before I think the the understanding in terms of IOCG deposits came about. But um, I'm afraid I can't um, I can't offer any sort of detailed uh, uh, answer to that question. It's it's an interesting question though. All right, Mike. And the last one that I have in my inbox, it says, can you comment on the relative ages of the mineralization in the Central African Copper Belt, the Kalahari Copper Belt, and the Western Congo Belt? Yeah, and again, not, not specific. I don't have his exact day. It was specific ages um, that I can quote, um, other than to say that I'm sure that we do, we do see... Um, instances, examples of um, early mineralization, sort of diagenetic um, res mineralization early within the geological history, um, right through all the way to, um, you know, you, the Demarin orogeny, which really produced that fold and thrust belt and um, a lot of the, the secondary remobilized mineralization that, that, that we saw in those examples. So I guess there's a bit of both, you know, there's certainly the late, um, Mineralization that's registered the Demarin, um, which is probably about 550 thereabouts, I would say. Um, but there's probably also an element of, of earlier, sort of really early diagenetic type mineralization as well, even if that's only sort of like framboidal pyrite. But um, but at the same time, it would have been a, a that would have represented a source for sulfur for you know for later fixing with the copper bearing fluids. All right. The next question is: Is the copper mineralization in the Kalahari copper belt structurally controlled or lithologically controlled primarily? Um, I'd say primarily is lithologically controlled, um, in that these are, I mean, you're looking at it like a, you know, these deposits are are kilometers long typically, and so they form these sheet-like, um, thin layered deposits which are you know, associated with the first reduced horizon that, that we come to. And it's the same in the, um, in the, in the Central African Copper Belt, even, even in Kamoa, you know, which is slightly different in that West Poland region. Um, but the same model applies there, basically, where you have the mineralization associated with the first sort of reduced horizon you come to. So that's a major stratigraphic control that, um, that I think is the predominant control, uh, structural, um, control is like superimposed on that, um, you know, subsequently, I would say, um, but it's, as I said several times or pointed out, um, that's from a, from a grade point of view in the Kalahari Copper Belt, the structural control is important in that um, the, uh, it, it really upgrades the mineralization in a lot of cases, you know, rather than having a look at it, rather than looking at your typical sort of 1.3, 1.4% copper, which is um, which is difficult to go underground for, um, you know, if you have higher grade mineralization associated with um, structural controls, you know, that represents really quite an 
exciting expression, target. And I think it's what a lot of companies like Sandfire um, are, are, are looking at currently. All right. Uh, you have touched on the amount of exploration work happening in the Galari Copper Belt. So there is a question on how much exploration is currently being done in the West Congo Belt. Yeah, not, not, not too much. Um, you know, up in, in, the, in the central part, um, well, the only the exploration that I know of is around um, Mbamba Kalenda, um, which is really accelerating. You know, that's a, it's a company called Central, um, Central Copper Resources, which are in the process of listing on the London Stock Exchange and raising uh, quite a bit of um, capital to explore. You know, as we speak, they're, they're listing and raising that to both to develop the Mbamba Kalenda deposit and to explore, and this is all public, you know, in the public domain on their website, to explore about an 80 kilometer strike length of, um, of license holding that, um, that they have. So that's really exciting, you know, and I think we can really look forward to or predict future discoveries along that 80 kilometer trend within their license. Um, that deposit that I mentioned in, in Angola, um, uh, is, uh, is has seen some renewed exploration earlier this year. So although it's been mined historically, there is a renewed exploration effort going on there. Um, further to the Northwest within the West Congo belt, um, the only work that I'm aware of is, is the early sort of the colonial um, work, which goes back to like the sixties. Um, and although that's well-documented, I don't think there's been much modern systematic exploration there at all, you know, so that, um, as far as I know, not much has been done there and that's um, underexplored and yeah, somebody should, should look at that sometime. Thanks, Mike. Um, it doesn't look like we have more questions. So thank you for the brilliant talk and for your time. Uh, to everyone, if you are interested in other topics that Mike is offering as a lecturer, I'd like to ask and you'd like to ask him to present at one of your events, I do encourage you to look at the SAG website and look at his web page for the talks that he can offer to your university or to your student chapter. With that said, we will now take a 10 minute break. Please do join us again at one, at 35 past one o'clock p.m. Mountain Time. We will be um, joined by Ross Shilok to present on the amazing uh, talk that he has prepared. Thank you for listening and see you soon. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Joy Carter, and I'm currently a master's student at the University of Toronto. I'll be moderating the second half of our traveling lecture symposium. Um, so before we begin with our next speaker, I will have a quick announcement about our um, student chapter vlog competition, um, which is right here. So this competition will encourage student chapters to create short uh, virtual economic geology videos and share them with their fellow members worldwide, creating a truly global contest that showcases a, an amazing range of diverse geological sites. This vlog will be about six minutes long and it gives a great opportunity for students to showcase something that's close to home to people who are across the world. The deadline has fortunately been extended to next Friday, um, April, August 6th, so it's not too late. You have lots of time to either finish up your vlog, sorry, you plenty of time to start one too. Um, so uh, be sure to submit your vlog and share that with uh, your peers to connect with the SEG student members um, across the world. So for those of you who are just joining us now, um, I'd like to give a brief reintroduction of our speakers today. So far, we've heard from Mike Venter, the SEG VP for Regional Affairs, and Mike Robertson, the Regional Vice President Lecturer. Mike Robertson has already spoken on the emerging frontier of sediment-hosted copper in Africa. So if you missed it, uh, I would encourage you to uh, watch the recording that will be posted uh, within the next 24 hours. Uh, Ross Sherlock, the SEG International Exchange Lecturer, and Julie Rowland, the SEG Thayer Lindsley Visiting Lecturer, will be speaking in the second half of our event. So Ross will be going up first, and Ross is a faculty member and research chair at the Hartwell School of Earth Sciences at Laurentian University, where he is the director of the Mineral Exploration Research Center and the Metal Earth Project. 
Before Laurentian, Ross worked for over 30 years in the exploration industry, domestically and internationally for senior and junior companies. At SEG, Ross has served on the Student Affairs Committee as a counselor for our industry, two terms on the editorial board, and he is currently on the publication board, a director of SEG Canada and the International Exchange Lecture. Over to you, Ross. So thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to uh, present here today and speak to you. Um, so I'm the director of the Mineral Exploration Research Center, and this is really a collaborative center for mineral exploration research and education. We get our funding from industry as well as government and, and Laurentian University. We really focus on field-based collaborative research uh, on exploration-related problems, and we really specialize and focus on Precambrian ore systems. We have over 100 faculty, research scientists, and graduate students typically working across the globe. We're the lead organization on the Metal Earth Project, and I'll, what's what I'm going to speak to you today about is some of the earlier results that have come out of Metal Earth. Membership in Merck provides a seat on our advisory board, which allows you to, to guide and influence the projects. Catherine Farrow is our chair, and Benoit Dubé is our, our science advisor. This is our membership, and as always, we'd like to thank our membership for uh, their continued support and guidance and, and the, our activities. So Metal Earth, it's, it's led by Merck. It's really a collaborative research project and it's focused on metal endowment in the Precambrian Shield and what controls differential metal endowment. It's not just Laurentian. We have partners with University of Quebec at Chicoutimi, University of Laval, Ottawa, University of Toronto and University of Alberta. The overall goal at Metal Earth is really to improve the science of targeting and finding new ore bodies. It's a fully funded project and with about $104 million uh, over seven years, making it one of the largest research projects in earth sciences ever, and certainly one of the largest related to uh, exploration related problems and initiatives. The bulk of the funding came out of a Canada First Research Excellence Fund, and so this is uh, a funding agency within the federal government of Canada. Uh, $5 million came out of Northern Ontario to Charity Fund. Uh, some, some funding came from David Harkwell, who was the, uh, uh, one of the donors at Laurentian and uh, named our uh, department from. And we have cash and in-kind from a variety of private sector and government survey partners. Project started in 2017 and we anticipate it going to uh, August 2026. So we have two separate components to Metal Earth. And really I'll talk about the science component that we're working on, but it's really to transform our understanding of Earth's early evolution and the processes that govern differential metal endowment. And by that, what I mean is when you look at a geological map, ore bodies are not evenly distributed. There are clustered, there are specific controls on mineralization, and even areas with, with very similar geology, some may be very highly endowed, some may be very weakly endowed. And so the process is a result in that differential endowment is really critical for our continued success in exploration and development. And so this fundamental science component really directly translates into improving the science of targeting and finding new ore bodies. We also have a very applied innovation and commercialization component. And because the bulk of the funding came out of a Canada first research excellence fund, this is really to cement Canada as a global leader in mineral exploration research. Everything that we do is open source. It's all public data and it is all targeted and driven towards developing technologies that will increase exploration success. And that has a spin-off of improving the training of quality MGO scientists for the industry. So our strategy is really to focus on our key and greenstone belts. This is in the backyard of, of Laurentian University. It's what we've always focused on. And greenstone belts represent about 60% of Earth's history and almost 50% of Canada's wealth. We're also resolving ore systems at, at various controls. So we're working on a craton scale, a greenstone belt scale, district scale, and deposit scales. And really what I'll talk about today is really the work that we're doing on transect scale or greenstone belt scales. 
And we're also imaging ore and non-ore systems at the full crust mantle scale. And, you know, typically as economic geologists, you know, we jump into the middle of an ore body, we do our thing, we go home, and we never look outside of it. We never really ever see the margins of it. And we very seldom ever look on uh, areas that just have very poor metal endowment, because uh, that's not what we do. We work on ore bodies. So that's what's fairly unique about the Metal Earth Project is that we're looking at both. And we're looking at both with the same degree of resolution to really be able to try to distinguish between these and, and try to develop tools to allow companies and industry to distinguish this. We're focused on the superior craton, um, really because it's had over 100 years of really high quality geoscience, framework geoscience. It's really unprecedented. It's one of the best, if not the best, understood Precambrian terrains in the world. And so this really allows us to build upon this and leverage off of this information so that we're not trying to recreate the wheel. We can start at a very high level of uh, geoscience knowledge. So why do we need Metal Earth? You know, why is it even uh, a funded project? And you, know, you can see various statistics on the success of the minerals industry. And I just took this out of uh, Dan Wood's SEG newsletter. What he's showing here is that the value of the discoveries is about half of what the exploration investment has been in it. So we're spending about a dollar to create about 50 cents worth of wealth. And that's really unsustainable as an industry. And a large part of this is that the industry is focused on brownfields environments. And this makes sense. The best ounce of gold you can find is the one that's adjacent to your mill. Greenfield discoveries, they're trying to find new districts, trying to find new ore bodies in previously unknown areas. You know, this is very rare. Very few companies are working in this environment. And that's really because the risk is high and the timeline is very high from, from conception to drill to definition to production is, is, is in a time frame that is typically not an acceptable time frame for most of the industry. So really to be successful in a greenfields environment, we require new tools. We need new tools to be effective in these spaces and we need to be looking in deep covered areas or deep environments uh, below our current uh, usual drilling depth. We need to be in covered environments, areas we don't have outcrop and remote areas, areas you know, in the Canadian context that are uh, remote from infrastructure, remote from roads, which are much more difficult to access that haven't had the exploration, uh, uh, the exploration maturity as we do in some of the southern parts of, uh, of Canada. But to be effective there and to de-risk this, we need better tools to allow us to be much more effective in selecting the areas that we're going to work in. So I'm going to spoke, you know, this is the superior craton. Uh, it's from uh, Percival in 2007. And we're really focused on the Abitibi, which is here in, uh, in green, as well as the Wabagoon. And I didn't highlight, forgot to highlight the Eastern Wabagoon. So it's over in here. I'll show you some sections from here, as well as through the, the Western Wabagoon. This is the Abitibi, and this is our uh, transects that we've, we've run on these. And so each of these areas, so it starts off at Shibugamu, up in the northeast part of the Abitibi. This is really a copper gold camp. The Malartic transect, so this goes right through the uh, Canadian Malartic mine. Naranda transect, which goes through the Naranda mining camp and the Horn mine. Larder Lake, which is centered over the Cadillac Larder Lake fault system, as well as the Kerr Addison deposit, Kirkland Lake deposit. Matheson, which is the uh, eastern extension of the Timmins camp and then has the Black Fox and Taylor mine associated with it. The Matheson, or sorry, uh, the Swayze transect through here, which goes through Cote Lake, a very large intrusive related gold deposit. And then we have transects here as well as at Cobalt and at Sudbury. And so each of these transects, we've done a very extensive seismic program, so reflection seismic surveys. We've done magnetic tellurics, which is, which is modeling and indicating the conductivity, resistivity of the crust. And we've done gravity and magnetics, as well as a lot of focused geoscience along these transects. Um, not to remap them, but really to uh, add value to the map and try to understand 
and improve the understanding of the geology. Uh, and effectively what we're doing is we're drawing cross sections across these greenstone belts. And each of these transects cross ancestral fault systems, volcanic centers and plutonic complexes that have a variable degree of metal endowment. And why are we working in this area? You know, because it's, this is the Duster Porcupine Fault off to the uh, north going from Timmins through Matheson and down into Duparquette. And then there's the uh, Cadillac Larder Lake Fault System, which starts over here in uh, Matachuan with Young Davidson, Kirkland Lake, Kerr Addison, uh, Miranda, Canadian Malartic, and then going into the uh, a Sigma Lamax system in, in Val d'Or. And so all of these deposits are located along these major fault systems, which are fundamental controls on the distribution of these gold deposits. And the gold endowment is exceptional. We look at the uh, Duster Porcupine, we're looking at almost 90 million ounces of gold, probably well over that by now. This is a 2017 uh, figure. The bulk of this is out of the Timmins camp. And then the Cadillac Larder Lake fault system, about 112 million ounces of gold, uh, starting over at Kirkland Lake and going into Cadillac and Daniel Bousquet and Laurent. Uh, significantly more if we add the uh, gold endowment of some of the uh, gold rich VMS or Sin Volcanic systems. We look over in the Wabagoon, and I'll show you some of the, the results from here. We have a much different distribution of gold deposits. It's relatively poorly endowed. We have the hard rock deposit, which is going into production with uh, a new company called Equinox. Goliath, which is a syn volcanic uh, system and Rainy River, which is an active mine by New Gold, but it's, it's again, it's, it's more of a syn volcanic system rather than an orogenic system. So the geology of Wabagoon is very similar to the Abitibi. I'll show you some st stratigraphic sections but the degree of metal endowment within these areas is, is very, very different. And so that's what we're trying to do is compare areas in the Abitibi from areas in the Wabagoon. So the Southern Abitibi subprovince is, is really has a basal volcanic assemblage with uh, ages around 2750 to 2695, overlain by uh, uh, sedimentary basins with the Porcupine and Pontiac, and then into the Temiskamine, which is much more of a uh, fluvial, alluvial, uh, very shallow marine type of assemblage. It's very similar to what we see in the Wabagoon. We have a basal uh, volcanic uh, assemblage, really going from a little bit older, from around 2770 to around 2720, overlain by deep marine tur turbidites and then unconformably overlain by alluvial, fluvial, shallow marine assemblages. So really stratigraphically, the Abitibi is, is really the same as the Wabagoon. It's just a little bit older, about 20, 25 million years older. So I'm gonna show you some of the data from the Abitibi and I'm gonna go into this in, in a fair bit of detail. So I'll go through the geology a little bit more than I will in the other, tr other transects. This is the map. This is the uh, you know, scale bar down here at about two kilometers. And this is the Cadillac Larder Lake deformation zone shown here in purple. So this is the main control on gold mineralization in this area. We also have the Lincoln Nipissing Fault, which I'll show you. It has a lot of similarities in terms of its str stratigraphy and juxt juxtaposition of volcanic assemblages as the Cadillac Larder Lake does. Much different gold endowment though. And this is the transect we worked on. So this is where we did geophysics and seismic, the MT, gravity, magnetics, as well as uh, uh, some very focused geoscience. We've had two postdocs and uh, three MSc students working on this transect over the last three years or so. And this also goes off to the north, up into the upper parts of the Blake River, at about 20 kilometers to the north or so. So I'm really just showing you the southern half of this transect. Proterozoic cover over to the east. And this is showing the mafic volcanic rock. So this is the Blake River group off to the north. And it has an unconformable contact with the Temiskaming assemblage to the south. 
these are the uh, volcanic rocks that are the equivalent to what is hosting some of the, the world-class VMS deposits in the Naranda district. We also have uh, Mayfoot volcanic rocks to the south, which is part of the skied assemblage, which is truncated here by the uh, cat or by the Lincoln Nipissing fault system. The Temiskamine assemblage is a fairly unique and unique rock assemblage, and it really marks the Cadillac Larder Lake fault uh, throughout its length. In the, in the light yellow here, we have uh, alkalic volcanic rocks. And these are really trachytic andesites for the most part. And then in the dark yellow, just to the north of that, as well as to the south, are alluvial fluvial sedimentary rocks, conglomerates, cross bedded sandstones. And then in brown is the, in part, at least the northern part, is Temiskamine sedimentary rocks, more of a marine facies, so very finely bedded turbidetic sandstones and mudstones. And to the south, they become a little bit older, and we're not really sure where it goes from Temiskamine assemblage off to the north to Hearst assemblage down to the south, but it's somewhere in this area. It's all intruded by Temiskamine intrusive rocks. These are small volume intrusives. They're variable in composition. They tend to be cyanitic, but they're really more high, high K calc alkaline intrusive rocks. These all have the same age as the sedimentary rocks, which sits about 2675 MA. These intrusions come along structures and they are associated with these clastic sediments. And they are the intrusive equivalent of the uh, trachytic andesites, which are the volcanic equivalent off to the, uh, mainly just to the northern part of the uh, Cadillac Larder Lake. The Larder Lake group, shown here in, in dark green, this is a uh, very significant, it's, it's in Timmins context, it'd be equivalent to the, uh, to the Tisdell group. It's equivalent to what is called the Pichet group in Quebec. And this really defines the Cadillac Larder Lake deformation zone. And it's really a succession of mafic and ultramafic volcanic rocks. We then have older mafic and ultramafics to the south. These are probably the equivalents of the Larder Lake group or the Pichet, overlain, unconformably overlain by the Temiskaming sediments. Show us the gold deposits in this area. So we start out on the uh, west side. These are all what you would consider orogenic gold deposits with Anoki and McBean. Upper Beaver is located here. It's off of the trend of the belt. It's associated with Temiskamine aged intrusions and, it, and it's a little bit different than anything else. Um, and we have Omega, uh, Fernland, Sheminus, Bear Lake, Barber Larder, McGarry, and then Kerr Addison. And so these all are fairly equally spaced along the Cadillac Larder Lake. By far the largest deposit is Kerr Addison with about 11 million ounces of production. Uh, and everything else is, is sub 1 million ounces. So again, we have a very um, quite strong periodicity. This is just a blow up here. So the Cadillac Larder Lake sits in through here, the deformation zone. Foot wall of it is the, the Larder Lake group. And we have a series of deposits, all of which are developed within the Larder Lake group. And we do see regional controls on these. If we look at the magnetics over top of the geology and just into the magnetics, we see a series of cross structures coming across the Cadillac Larder Lake. And where we start getting intersections of these northeast trending faults with the Cadillac Larder Lake fault, we end up getting deposits. And then we have the large of these fault systems and through here, which juxtaposes the Proterozoic rocks against the Archean stratigraphy, we get the by far the largest deposits in this belt, which is the Kerr Addison. And so we, we, we're not sure we entirely understand what the origin of these faults are. Uh, there's certainly uh, an empirical relationship between the intersection of these faults with the Cadillac Larder Lake, which is regionally controlling the distribution of the gold deposits. So we look at the transect and, and how are these faults expressed geophysically? Um, this is the, again, the pink line in through here is our seismic. The uh, box in through here is a, a more detailed seismic. And our MT lines, are, our stations are shown here in the big white dots. 
And these MT line or stations go off quite a bit further to the south and to the north and east and the west, really to create a much larger aperture of the survey so that it actually encompasses the main rocks of interest. These are the thumper trucks. So we were uh, we brought these over from Calgary from the oil patch and uh, deployed them on a lot of the, the, the small logging roads and uh, highways within uh, northern Ontario and Quebec. And uh, now they were quite a sight, you know, they didn't, uh, uh, um, we had to do a lot of public relations to let the communities know as to, as to what we we're doing with these. But, uh, you know, provided an awful lot of really high quality data that's going to be a, a, a long standing legacy of, of Metal Earth. So this is the seismic section. And so this is the south is over here, north is over here. So we're looking off to the west. Geology is across the top. So this is the skied volcanics down on the south. We have the Lincoln Missing Fault Zone. And through here, we go into the Hearst sedimentary succession and uh, volcanic rocks. We have the Temiskamine assemblage through here, which is the, uh, uh, the main zone of mineralization that's complexly deformed and it's predominantly uh, sediments, some trachytic volcanic rocks, as well as the uh, mafic and ultramafic assemblages of the larger lake group. And then we go to the north and through here and we're into the, uh, the Lake River group, much less intensely deformed. It's very broad, open uh, fold systems and extends further to the north. And so we interpret these seismic sections really by domains, you know, areas that we have domains of a lot of horizontal reflectors and areas that are essentially isotropic to the seismic waves. And so we have an isotropic zone in through here, isotropic zones in through here, and we also have a series of truncations of these prominent horizontal reflectors. You can see the scale we're going through, you know, each second is about three kilometers. So, you know, this is a 10 second section, 11 section, section, 11 sec seconds, so about 33 kilometers in total depth. And we can draw on the fault systems. So Lincoln Nipissing is in through here in yellow. Uh, we can trace this down to about 10 kilometers or so. So it is it's a very significant fault. It does have a little bit of gold mineralization associated with it, uh, but it, and, and a lot of similarities to the Cadillac Lighter Lake Fault but certainly not to the extent that we see up in the Cadillac Larder Lake. Cadillac Larder Lake really separates a zone of very strong reflectors in the uh, northern part to this area that is effectively isotropic with respect to the seismic waves. And then we have the Missima Lake, Mist Lake fault system off to the north, again, separating domains of high reflectivity with areas that are fairly isotropic. We look at the MT. So MT is, uh, you know, not everybody's aware of this. It's a, uh, uh, it's really a deep imaging technique. It uses natural uh, electrical currents in the crust, uh, either through aurora borealis or far field lightning storms. And it really is a way of measuring the conductivity of different portions of the crust. And you can see in this section here, it actually goes very deep, it goes down to plus 50 kilometers. This was the, uh, the main area of interest of the, uh, the seismic survey, but you can see the MT survey is much larger, collects just a much larger aperture so that we're not influenced by edge effects on the survey. Uh, what we see very commonly in the abitibi is we have this, this higher conductivity zone starts around 17 kilometers depth and, and is really sub-horizontal. And then we have these fingers coming off of it as well. So we'll just blow it up in here. This is really about the size of the, the seismic section. And you can see we're really mapping uh, much higher resistivity rocks here. And this, this is basically the greenstone belt. We're looking at the base of the greenstone belts and through here. And these are the domains of volcanic rock, the main domains of volcanic rock with zones of a little bit of, of sedimentary rocks as well. And then we have this mid crustal rocks, which are again a much higher uh, or much higher uh, conductivity, lower resistivity. So, the Cadillac Larder Lake break and through here has this very strong conductivity contrast, which 
we can trace down into 30 kilometers. The Lincoln Nipissing shear is located up through here. It has a very small conductivity contrast that we can only trace to about three kilometers. And this contrast is typically considered the product of hydrothermal fluid flow alteration effects, which really develops that contrast between areas that haven't seen the hydrothermal fluids or fluid flow and areas that have seen significant fluid flow. So when we look at that uh, MT, you know, what I was showing you was, was this is a cross section. So north is over here, south is over here. And if we look at a long section along this, we can see it's actually much more of a linear body. So this has a strong linear geometry associated with it. It trends about 220 degrees, plunges to the uh, at about 45 degrees. And when we look at our intersection of our fault systems, that we at least empirically have a control on the distribution and fold, they give us that same lineation. So it's really, we interpret this to be the intersection between the Cadillac Larder Lake fault system and these northeasterly trending faults, which are very steeply dipping. And so the intersection will get us that same lineation. And then in the outcrop, when we measure lineations on features such as variolitic basalts and the extension of the linear element on those variables, we have the same geometry. So, be, so this is really giving us some very reasonable confidence that what we're seeing, the MT is real. You know, we are seeing a linear geometry with the MT, which is reflecting measurable and observable geological features. So if we over top, overlay our MT with the, uh, the seismic, you can see we have the Cadillac Larder Lake coming up through here. We have this strong conductivity contrast sitting in the uh, hanging wall of the Cadillac Larder Lake Fault. Much, much higher gold endowment on this fault system than, than almost anywhere else within the Abitibi. We have the Lincoln Nipissing Fault, although it has a lot of similarities uh, on the surface, geological similarities, stratigraphic and structural with the Cadillac Larder Lake, we see almost no conductivity contrast associated with it. And then we had a bit of surprise. We, we, we have the Missima Lake Fault, which is uh, it's significant, it's mappable. Uh, it sits within the, the Blake River volcanic rocks, and it does seem to have a bit of a conductivity contrast with it. And uh, but we've yet to see any sort of significant mineralization associated with this, but very little exposure associated with it as well. So let's go over and take a look at the, uh, the Matheson transecting through here. And I won't go into the geology to the same degree, but this is centered along the, the Duster Porcupine Fault Zone and through here. So this is the Timmins Camp, which was 80, 90 million ounces of gold. And then we have a series of deposits along the Duster Porcupine, particularly with the Taylor Mine and the Black Fox Mine. And this is our transect and the cross sections will show you is, is right through in here. And this is the work of uh, one of our postdoctoral fellows, uh, Rasmith Hargard, who has just published this paper in economic geology. It's either in press, I think it's come out by now. And you can see the geology across the top. Uh, we have the lower Tisdale group, which is the equivalent of the larger lake group. We have the uh, uh, Duster Porcupine Fault System porcupine sediments, and then uh, some Kid Moreau, some, some mafic volcanic rocks. We can see this is very, very similar features. We have this sub-horizontal zone in the, uh, the, the contact between the mid and upper crust of very high conductivity rocks. We have this finger coming up towards the surface, which is just to the south of the uh, Duster Porcupine Fault. In detail, we think of the surface, the duster porcupine actually dips fairly shallowly, then steepens up again. So this would really be the trace of the duster porcupine fault system through here. And then going into the lower crust as well. So this is being traced down to about 30 kilometers in depth. And so the model that was developed by Rasma is really looking at uh, a you know, full crustal cross section with the upper crust granite greenstone belt uh, brittle ductile fault zone here with the, the Duster Porcupine Fault, 
mid crust granite tonalite plutons and then to the lower crust with the granulitic gneisses and the northocytes. And we're tracing this zone both through NT as well as, uh, as some of the seismic features as well. And so the primary results out of this is that you know, we had a fairly shallow southerly dip to the duster porcupine, which then steepens up at about three kilometers in depth. And the larger crustal scale geology indicates that we have a, a conductivity or, or high conductivity um, mid to lower crust, and then a, a fairly resistive upper crust corresponds to the volcanics and the greenstone belt. We have this deep crustal conductivity corridor then connects to the lower crust. And we have these fingers of higher conductivity that comes off of that. It's associated with the porcupine duster fault zone, which we're interpreting to be a deep seeded mineralizing system that we can identify and map through these MT uh, surveys. Let's go over to the Wabagoon, and this will be an area around the, uh, the Dryden area. And again, we have very, very similar geology to the Abitibi, um, just a little bit older. This is the geological map of the Dryden. You can see we have a series of mafic volcanic rocks, with unconformity, uh, turbidic sedimentary rocks, and then another unconformity. And we get uh, some of these alluvial, alluvial sedimentary rocks. We have a number of deformation zones and we'll be able to see the Mosher Bay Washabegama fault zone in through here. And that's associated with a, uh, a small gold deposit. And then we have the Wabagoon fault zone off to the north, which is just in the uh, foot wall of the Goliath deposit through here. And this was our transect line. So when we look at the seismic, it, you know, this is very simplified, but we're able to, to map out the Mosier Bay Washabegama deformation zone uh, well below 20 kilometers. And this is really on the basis of truncations of some of these really pronounced horizontal reflectors. And then we have the Wabagoon deformation zone off to the north, which is really on the margins of our survey. If we look at the, the MT, it's much different looking. You know, we have these, it's all broken up. We have these little domains of, of uh, very high conductivity and, and low resistivity. And then we have these areas that are, are very highly resistive up in the top, but it's quite broken up. It looks very, very different than the, uh, the MT surveys we see over in the Abitibi. If we overlay that with the seismic, Again, you can see this is a much larger aperture survey than our seismic, but we're able to map out this uh, Washabegama deformation zone up through here. There's a weak uh, zone of uh, lower resistivity coming up through here in the hanging wall zone. The Wabagoon deformation zone doesn't seem to have much of a, an MT signature as well. But again, the, the main takeaway though is that we have very different um, patterns within the uh, MT. We don't have this mid-crustal zone that is sub-horizontal with fingers coming off of it associated with some of these deep-seated fault systems. We'll take a look over at the uh, uh, the hard rock zone, and sorry, the Geraldton Onaman, and this is associated with the hard rock deposit. So this is over in the eastern part of the, the Wabagoon. And, and it's a bit different. We have three different geological domains here. We have the Quetico subprovince, which is predominantly um, sedimentary. It's a big sedimentary basin. We have the Beardmore Geraldton belt, which is a granite greenstone belt. And then we have the Onaman Toshota belt, which is a series of greenstones plus felsic intrusions and, and quite a bit of felsic volcanic rocks. And our transect comes up through here, takes a step then comes up and through here. And so we're really crossing these three different geological domains. Uh, the Quetico subprovince is, is very little gold mineralization, none that I'm aware of really that sits in the Quetico. The Beardmore Geraldton belt, this is what is hosting the hard rock deposit, which is you know, a significant gold deposit of about 6 million ounces, as well as a number of uh, gold prospects and historic gold mines. So it really is a fairly well endowed um, uh, granite greenstone terrain. 
and then we go up in the Ottoman Toshoda. And once we're just, just north of, you know, 10 kilometers north of Beardmore Geraldton Belt, there's very little uh, metallic mineralization associated with it. Interesting geology, there's interesting prospects, but very little in the way of, of gold endowment. So if we look at the uh, seismic through here, so this is one, uh, Susanna Toth, one of our postdocs who has uh, done an initial interpretation on this. So this is again, looking off to the west, south is over here, north is over here, it's, it's a bit busy, but you can see the critical metasedimentary belt in through here uh, with some fairly uh, good indications of a basement near the surface. We have the Beardmore Geraldton belt, and this is crossed by a series of, of very deep reaching fault systems uh, with the Paint Lake Fault and the Quetico Fault down in through here. And then we have the Ottoman Toshoto belt up through here with a, uh, a number of different lithologies, a uh, number of different uh, seismic domains as well. And then we have a series of fault systems that are, are relatively shallow. We don't see these tapping very deep. You know, 30 kilometers is here, 45. This is the Moho down at the base here. And we can uh, identify the, the, the Quetico Fault or whatever the local name of it is down into the Moho, but certainly nothing in the Ottoman Toshoto belt uh, looks similar. It all seems to be quite a bit shallower. And if we look at the MT, again, we have a much different pattern than what we saw in the Abitibi. So those sub-horizontal zones in the mid-crust of uh, higher conductivity rock just don't seem to exist here. But we do have the fingers that are coming up. And when we compare this with the uh, seismic, we have some of these fingers are coming up into the Beardmore Geraldton belt. Uh, both at the south from the Quetico metasedimentary contacts in, and as well as coming up from the uh, uh, Ottoman Toshoto belt as well. So these seismic are, uh, surveys really mapping deep seated fault systems down into the Moho. The MT survey uh, shows very distinct conductivity contrasts within the hanging wall all of these faults and we get very significant contrast in the near surface of the Beardmore Geraldton, uh, very similar to what we see in the Abitibi. But when we look at the Quetico and we look at the Ottoman Toshoto, we just don't get that pattern. And so we're seeing very different patterns and we're seeing very uh, different levels of metal endowment, much weaker metal endowment. So the signature of these fertile fault systems is that we have a large resistive upper crust where we're mapping the greenstone belts. Mm -hmm. We have localized low resistivity zones in the upper crust, such as in through here, which is uh, mapping out some of these um, very significant fault systems, these fertile fault systems. And we also have very extensive uh, mid to lower crust conductivity zones, which is much more continuous. And when we start looking in parts of the Wabagoon, which has different metal endowment, we have very different uh, MT patterns. And just to show you some of the other examples of this. So this is uh, uh, Heinsen's uh, paper in 2018 on Olympic Dam. This was really a very significant from a, an MT contest. And what he's done is mapped out uh, conductivity resistivity domains within the upper crust. You can see we've been down about 15 to 20 kilometers, very similar to what we're seeing, uh, sort of the depths that we're mapping in the, in the Abitibi and Wabagoon. We have areas of, of essentially uh, anisotropic to, uh, the seismic, uh, to the seismic survey. And we have these fingers coming off, very similar to what we see in the Abitibi. And C2 is associated with Olympic Dam and through here. And then we have other prospects that are very, some of the more significant prospects in this area. So this is interpreted as really the pathway of a magnetic hydrothermal system, uh, fluid flux and metal flux from the lower crust up into the near surface forming Olympic Dam. And if we look at a much younger system, such as in uh, the Southern Ops of New Zealand, uh, a much younger orogenic system, 
we have the Alpine Fault. We have this is sorry, this is the work of Phil Wanamaker in, in uh, 2002, but he sees very similar type of resistivity conductivity contrast within the uh, the mid to upper crust, and then we have these fingers of uh, more higher conductivity material in the near surface, and they're associated with gold mineralization. And this is this is thought to be the result of alteration induced changes in the rocks uh, in the uh, upper crustal regime. So what are the differences between these belts? You know, we're able to map fertile fault systems. Uh, they tend to be very late planar features. They're separating domains of variable seismic impedance. The upper crust tends to be largely resistive and broad zones of low resistivity in the lower crust. And these deep seated faults have localized fingers of low resistivity and tends to be in the immediate hanging wall of these faults. And we're able to demonstrate this quite well in the Abitibi. Um, you know, we're really not going to get a prize for trying to identify these faults in the Abitibi. You know, we, we, we know they're fertile, we know their characteristics quite well. But what we're trying to do is be able to identify various features of these fault systems in the Abitibi and in the Wabagoon and be able to extend this into areas that do not have the same degree of, uh, of framework geoscience. So can we take this to the Beremian of West Africa? MT is a very uh, fairly simple survey. Uh, it's very complicated processing, but the survey is fairly simple. Uh, we don't need seismic. We can get the same sort of information with gravity and magnetics. But can we get these same expressions of deeper fault systems, fertile fault systems? Can we see this in areas that have uh, less framework geoscience? Can we take them into remote areas and covered areas? Northern Canada, for example, the Beremian of West Africa, the Guyana Shield, North China Craton, some of these areas that are very prospective, but they're very large areas. And to be successful and to uh, really reduce exploration risk. Some of these tools we think will be very effective at that area selection, being able to, to par down the area um, that you can work in as a company. So these areas of weaker metal endowment, you know, we can map it, but we're still not entirely sure why. You know, is this just a different fertility in the supercrustal rocks? is a different volcanic rocks. You know, most notably, we, we get very few comatiites over in the Wabagoon, where we have a significant amount of comatiites in, in the Abitibi. Was the timing of the fluid generation different? Was it different than the timing of different emission? So when we were deforming these rocks, we just weren't generating fluids to allow it to uh, alter the rocks and, and uh, transport metals. Is it a difference in the overall lithospheric architecture under plating by a different substrate or different geodynamic processes? And see, the, these are all aspects that we're trying to address now, trying to understand what was the uh, mechanism or the lack of the mechanism that resulted in these different processes that result in this differential metal endowment. With that, I'll thank you and uh, thank you for the opportunity and I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thanks, Ross, for that really important uh, and interesting talk. Uh, we'll take some questions now from uh, anyone in the audience. Uh, just a reminder to please send your questions to the uh, Q&A section at the bottom. Um, so we have one talk here um, from Edward Bunker, who says, thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I am aware that empty conductivity can be a result of sulfides, clays, and other geological factors. Do you think that these deeper conductive anomalies that often underlay deposits result from sulfides, clay alteration, both, or some something completely different? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. You know, we're looking down 30 kilometers depth, and we're trying to understand what some of these, uh, you know, really, yeah conductivity contrasts are that really only manifest themselves under high pressure and temperature. Um, most of the work that's been done, um, started off by John Percival and the Kapuskasian structure has, has identified them as graphitic films. So you have graphitic films that are uh, connected and they are providing the, uh, uh, the, the conductivity 
for uh, that we're seeing in the MT survey. So that's that's one of the main theories as what's what's providing those conductivity contrasts. And of course, you know, once you have a conductivity film, you don't really necessarily see below it very well. So you really a lot of that uh, higher conductivity material that's at depth really may just be an artifact of having a boundary in the in the mid crustal level. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, so with regards to the Wab Wabagoon, where is most exploration currently being focused at the moment? And given its less robust gold endowment than the Abitibi, does it continue to be an attractive belt for new exploration projects? Yeah, it does. And, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a domain with, with weaker gold endowment, it's, it, but it's not barren. So you have an active mine there at Rainy River. So this is a, a very significant operation by New Gold. I don't remember the pro annual production offhand, but it's a, you know, it's a multi-million ounce deposit. You also have a project in uh, the Hard Rock project, you know, that was just purchased by Equinox. And that's a north of a six million ounce deposit. It's going to be a large open pit and Equinox are, um, you know, have, have gone beyond the feasibility stage or in the permitting stage for, for developing this deposit. And then the other one I highlighted was Goldlund. You know, that is a uh, treasury metals. They have a, a significant deposit at, uh, sorry, it wasn't Goldlund, it was uh, Goliath. They have Goliath and Goldlund, which are just north of Dryden. And so they have very active programs in those areas as well and uh, are pushing forward for a development scenario that will, will develop both of those deposits. Um, so I wouldn't say, you know, pe people are working in the Wabagoon, people are successfully working in the Wabagoon, but if you contrast that to the Abitibi, the, the amount of work being done is significantly less. Would you be able to comment on the results that you've seen um, in the Swazi Belt? In the Swazi Belt? Swazi yeah. Belt. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we, we, we have very similar results that we would see in the Abitibi. And it's a, uh, we're, we have a, a PhD student there, Tom Gemmel, who's doing a lot of remapping and getting a lot more geochronology within the Swayze. So he's developing a lot more Blake River aged rocks in through the Swayze that was not identified in the past. So these are a bit younger volcanic rocks. The, you know, the ride out fault system, which comes through, which is probably the extension of the Cadillac Larder Lake does have similar features that we see in the Larder Lake. So we have this uh, strong uh, conductivity contrast within the uh, structural hanging wall of the fault system. Um, Swayze is a bit different because it doesn't have that high a degree of metal endowment. You know, it does have Cote gold deposit, which is a, which is a monster deposit. It's a huge deposit. And that is just north of the ride out. So there is certainly a significant amount of uh, metal flux coming on associated with that. Um, and we do have very similar patterns that we do in the larger lake. I think that, that that's, uh, that's really interesting. And uh, I think uh, that's it for the questions right now. I think from now we'll move on to Julie's talk. So Julie is currently uh, the Deputy Dean of Science at the University of Auckland. She is a structural geologist by training, completing her PhD at the University of Otago under the supervision of Rick Simpson. During this time, she developed an interest in technomagmatic uh, hydrothermal interactions, which she has applied to the understanding of geothermal and epithermal systems. JR is a Skinner awardee and the the current Thayer Lindsley traveling lecturer for the SEG. All right, I'll pass it over to you, JR. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, and thank you very much, Joy. How's that sound at my end? Is that all right for you, Joy? Okay, I'm just going to try sharing my screen. Kia ora uh, koutou, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to give this um, talk uh, as the um, Thayer Lindsley uh, visiting lecturer, even though I don't seem to be able to go anywhere because the New Zealand borders are shut. Um, it, it's, this is a great opportunity. So um, I'm just starting this, uh, this webinar uh, with this title slide here. And, and what I'm going to look at is, is the active epithermal analog 
that we have in the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And you can see at the bottom, I've put a little reference map there. So there's New Zealand down there, um, just off to the side of Australia on an active plate boundary. And what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to um, start by giving a few structural fundamentals that I think um, are useful to have as background when we're thinking about um, the controls on regional scale localization of the uh, hydrothermal systems that produce epithermal deposits. And uh, then we're going to get into having a look at that in the New Zealand context and the total volcanic zone in particular. And then we're also going to have a look at, uh, in a little bit more detail, at some examples of geothermal systems in the Taupo volcanic zone to uh, try and um, flesh out some of the reservoir scale controls on fluid flow. And I'm just starting with this picture here, which is, of course, the famous Champagne Pool. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, but you can see some of the uh, vital statistics of the pool up on the top there from James Pope's work. And uh, you can actually see the bubbles of carbon dioxide coming out of this pool and the flock that's uh, arsenic and antimony sulfur colloid flock on the, on the margin of the pool in the center around the edge. Um, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. So let's get into it and let's have a look at, uh, to start with, the epithermal districts in New Zealand. And um, these are all in the North Island of New Zealand. And I'm, I'm just going to show you that there are three areas that we would consider um, to be epithermal districts. And we've got uh, a one up in the north uh, part of New Zealand, the North Island, uh, where Puhipuhi uh, is an epithermal deposit that's been explored. And we have Ngāwha, uh, the active geothermal system up there. And then if you come down onto this uh, peninsula here, the Coromandel Peninsula, and for reference, Auckland uh, is located here just uh, and beside that to the west. This is the Hauraki Goldfield that occupies the Coromandel Volcanic Zone. And then the third district is the one I'm going to concentrate most on today, which is the Topol Volcanic Zone, where we have the active geothermal fields. And this is a picture here of one of my mentors, Bernard Spurley, taken by Stuart Simmons in the underground workings of Golden Cross within the Hauraki Goldfield, showing you these beautiful epithermal veins that we can see there. And down below here from the Topol Volcanic Zone, we can see the cooling tower, the rather monolithic structure there associated with the Broadlands or Haki geothermal field. So the active analog maybe to, uh, to the system, these sorts of systems that produced um, these beautiful vein deposits in the Hauraki goldfield. If you actually look at um, why we've got those three uh, different belts, it's all to do with the fact that the North Island of New Zealand uh, hosts um, currently this active volcanic arc that com comes down um, parallel to our subduction margin, of course, from Tonga, right down into the central part of New Zealand, and that forms our total volcanic zone. And all of these sort of red dots here are showing you active volcanoes along that arc. But if you jump back um, 6 million years, there was an arc that lasted for about 10 million years in this orientation down through here, intercepting the Coromandel, and strangely, no volcan volcanic material in this part of the country here, but more uh, out over here. And that's back into the 15 to 16 MA uh, arc. And then older volcanics uh, up into the Northland area. So we've got a, a, a history of, um, particularly from the last 15 million years, of lateral migration of an arc associated with, if you like, uh, rollback of the subduction uh, margin. And that's allowed these locales of heat and mass uh, transfer, which are, the which are recorded in the epithermal systems and the geothermal systems, have migrated to the southeast through time. And um, this heat and mass transfer is superimposed upon a relatively simple basement structure. And I'll just show you that, because if you have a look at this red line through here, this is an excellent marker for New Zealand's um, first order basement structure. That is uh, the aeromagnetic magnetic signal of the Dun Mountain Ophiolite Belt. And um, New Zealand is only half a billion years old, and it's really the flotsam and jetsam that came off the margin of Gondwana and was accreted in an accretionary origin 
uh, against the Gondwana margin and then ripped apart along the Alpine Fault in more recent times. But figuratively speaking, a series of ribbon terrains uh, smacked onto the margin, rotated a bit into, into the shear zone. And most of the basement terrains follow suit. So these arcs are superimposed upon a relatively simple basement structure. And I'll just show you something about that, particularly after Ross's talk that I think is sort of interesting. If you look at our epithermal systems uh, in the North Island and look at that marker that I told you about, the Dun Mountain Ophiolite Belt, there's another marker out here that does the same thing. That's the old uh, ancient arc, roots of the ancient arc along the margin of Gondwana. Um, but if you look at this, offset by the Alpine Fault, there are those markers popping out down on the bottom of the South Island, and here are the Otago gold fields. So it's quite interesting that even though we've got different types of mineralization here, orogenic in the south, epithermal in the north, the, there's an interesting spatial relationship with those big, deep-seated, long-lived, uh, lithospheric scale terrain boundaries that might um, tickle Ross's fancy. Okay, so moving forward, let's get into these three structural fundamentals that I think are really useful to think about when uh, we consider um, controls on fluid flow um, that may ultimately produce a, a, an ore deposit. And the first one is that mechanical segmentation is a feature at all scales um, in brittle and ductile materials. You can see segmentation uh, in just compaction induced segmentation in alternating sandstones and mudstones shown here on this figure on the left. And there's a, a typical scale that happens in the layers. So if you look at the thick layer here, you get fractures that break up that thick layer at a particular width. If you go to a thin layer, you see that the, um, that layer is broken up in, by fractures that actually have closer spacing. So th there's this relationship between the scale of a, a layer, a brittle layer that is breaking, and then the, the dimensions of those broken pieces. And, and you see this at, at big scale with um, uh, lithospheric scale segmentation of, of, the, um, well, of the lithosphere. And you can see that in the development of boudins leading to even metamorphic core complexes. So mechanical segmentation is a key feature. And then what that does, that segmentation, is it produces linked fault systems, if you think about it in a tectonic context. So if you take a look at the North Island of New Zealand, as we are here, and you can see that off to the north, we've got those double arcs that were once one arc, and they've split apart in this zone of back arc rifting through there. If you zoom in and you look at that back arc rifting here, you're looking at a relatively simple case of oceanic crust, and what you can see, at the, there are alignments of, of features actually dominated by magmatic um, intrusion leading to volcanic chains going across this zone. And in between, there are segments of a rift segment. So you get this, this tectonic segmentation. You've got a long line length here of rifting, breaking up this ocean crust into, into certain length segments. Uh, with intervening transfer zones in between. So this notion of segmentation producing linked fault systems. Um, some of the segmentation, if you get into more complex material, can produce, uh, can, can exploit inherited fabrics. And an example that I like to show here is from East Africa. Um, Cindy Ebinger did some terrific work a number of years ago now looking at the length scale of the big border faults around the East African Rift. And um, you can see that coming down here on this, on this sketch, this graph on the right-hand side, where you've got border fault length compared to the seismogenic thickness of the crust. And you can see that in the Afar area, uh, up in the north of Africa, you've got very short border faults, 25 to 30 kilometers, and pretty thin, brittle crust. And then if you get down to the south in Africa and you get to the big rifts, um, you've got border faults that might be 100 kilometers long and very thick crust. So there's a, a very nice linear relationship. If you then go and look in detail into, say, something like the Kenya Rift, and this is great work by Le Turdu et al., and you start to map out the structures, what you find is that these, um, these 
breaks between border faults and rift segments, they align with um, deep-seated pre-existing structures that can be mapped in from the plateau on either side of the rift. So you've got these cross structures here that are acting as transfer uh, faults, if you like, between rift segments. And, and the interesting thing, you can see this little star here, that's a hydrothermal system. So these hydrothermal systems are sitting on um, these connections between these transfer structures and these rift segments. So um, that mechanical segmentation is exploiting inherited fabrics and structures, and maybe it's got something to do with fluid flow. Um, those inherited structures, what we know, um, and they, they are effectively partitioning strain. So the deformation is getting partitioned in different ways. And I just want to show you this third fundamental because it comes into uh, what I'm going to talk about later. When we often think about strain partitioning, if you're a tectonicist or a structural geologist, you might think of it in plan view, in map view. So here's an example. Here we've got the Pacific plate whacking into the north, uh, whacking into the Australian plate in the vicinity of the North Island of New Zealand, and the direction of travel is oblique to that subduction margin. So it's not coming in straight on. Now, because it's oblique, a component of that movement is actually transferred into the upper plate, producing a strike slip system in the overriding plate. So that's an example of strain partitioning. But strain partitioning can also happen in the depth dimension. And I want to show you this little picture from out here by an excellent piece of work by Jiba et al. in 2012. This area has been seismically imaged in great detail. And if you have a look at the seismic imagery, you can backstrip to different depths looking at the sedimentary pile. And depth, of course, is time. So you can look at structures that were active through different time. If you look deeply, you will see that the structures with this orientation were active in the late Cretaceous. Those structures are actually those first order basement terrain structures being reactivated in extension. And then if you come up sequence, you're looking in shallower, um, shallower sequence, you're looking in more recent time, that those structures start to change direction and they become northeast. But they're rooting onto these older structures at depth. And even more shallowly, more recent in time, you see they really start to pick up those northeast trends. And those northeast trends are the active plate boundary, the pattern of faulting that we see today. So it's interesting that you can have faults that are active very recently being rooted on faults with a completely different of orientation at depth, and that is strain partitioning in the vertical dimension. Now, why would I be interested in that? Um, I'm interested in it because it, um, it, those places where you have the more shallow structures rooting onto deep-seated structures that may have a different orientation, those have potential for very deep connectivity in terms of fluid flow. And um, one of the questions I would have is, how can we recognize where we might have those basement structures linking up, up section into shallower, differently oriented structures? And, and one way is to look at these sorts of anomalous patterns you might get that might define them. Here's the older structure at depth in light gray, and then the younger structures coming in, turning into and being affected by that deeper seated structure. And it's all to do with this notion of fluid connectivity at depth. So here you might have a rifting environment. Um, before the rift really cranks up and gets going, you might have a cover sequence of sedimentary units crudely horizontally layered on top of some sort of basement in New Zealand that is a, a, a metasedimentary a basement that we colloquial, colloquially refer to as grey wacky. And at some depth, the, you're going to change from mostly brittle behaviour into something that is more quasi-plastic, and commonly we would call that the brittle ductile transition. Below that big fault, that big first order fault, will be a shear zone rooting into that ductile mid-crust. Now, one of the things that happens in a rifting system, particularly has happened in the topo volcanic zone, is that through time, associated with the arc and with rifting, 
we see that brittle ductile transition shallow. And I think that's interesting because if the brittle ductile transition shallows, then what you're really doing is cannibalizing the crust and um, changing it from brittle to ductile behavior. And those large first order scale faults are gonna be focusing those shear zones in what is now becoming ductile lower crust. And that provides a mechanism for juicing up any hydrothermal systems above um, because you are focusing fluid flow within those shear zones in that ductile, ductile regime. And not just aqueous fluids, magmas as well. So um, I'm particularly interested in, in these inherited structures getting reactivated into um, in rift systems where that brittle ductile transition is shallowing. So those are three fundamentals that I've raced through there. And now I want to get into the topal volcanic zone in detail. But before I get, I jump right into the geothermal area, I want to again remind you of the epithermal deposits that we have to the north of the topal volcanic zone. So these are the deposits in the Hauraki gold fields and they are scaled according to um, uh, tonnage and gold that's been taken out of those deposits. And they've also got um, a little red bar on them showing you the dominant vein orientation. And um, against them, you will see this Hodaki rift fault. This is a rather strange feature. It, it started a, this a, a rift developed through here, maybe around about 7 million years ago. It is still active, but slow moving. Rather odd because it's at very high angle to the plate boundary, which is parallel to the topal volcanic zone down here. Now out to the side, I'm showing you that junction magnetic anomaly again, that big basement terrain marker. And off to the side again, one of those big faults, that's that basement fault I just showed you that comes up. up it's, this is buried here, but it comes up and, and transfers into these uh, more modern structures in the shallow surface. When you look at this, you can see all these lines on here, all these faults through uh, the North Island of New Zealand. It's a pretty busy area uh, in terms of faulting. But currently, the locus of activity is in red. And you can see that we've got the topal rift coming down through here. On top of this, I've put some boxes here showing you where the geothermal systems are. And they're scaled according to the megawatts thermal, um, the output of these systems. But you can also see patterns of faults that are older through here. So you can get a sense of the patterns. Um, when we move forward and we have a look at the next slides, just remember that there's this very odd rift coming in through here, and it actually intercepts the topal volcanic zone in through here. And we see some sign of that with some of the faults coming through in here, and also some of the localization of, of, of um, magmas that have come up to form uh, volcanic units in this area here. If we zoom in, and have a look at the topal volcanic zone. This is an image that um, I published quite a while ago now, um, but it's based on uh, uh, several people's data. And the, the underlying map here is a resistivity image. The geothermal systems in the topal volcanic zone were delimited based on um, the shallow resistivity image in that area. And what you're looking at is color coding where the red is showing you very conductive ground. Um, the boundary here between the red and the yellow is probably representing the 30 ohm meter contour for resistivity. So in those red zones, you're picking up um, the geothermal systems that are active today. And as well as that, I'm showing you um, the active uh, Caldera is the active rhyolitic centers in here. This is the Topal Caldera, capable of super eruptions. Uh, this is the Okataina Caldera up and through here. So they are considered active today. There are also these dashed lines that show you the position of inferred calderas uh, boundaries for eruptions that have happened in the past. As well as that, you can see uh, the black lines showing you the topal rift faults. The, if you've got good eyes, you might see tick marks on them showing the dipping directions. Those dipping directions define rift axes. Here's one in white up here in the north. Um, this one through the central part of the topal volcanic zone, segmented down here. And you can pick these rift segments because you start to get perturbations in the, fault, in the faults. 
So you can start to see where uh, the rift system is segmented along strike. As well as that, on this image, you can see the big border fault out here, the Kaimaroa fault on the eastern margin. There's another rather large structure through here, the Paioroa fault. And it's intriguing that a lot of the geothermal activity is in this zone through here. We call this the Taupo Evaporor Basin. There's not much faulting that you can see at the surface in there, but there's a heck of a lot of heat flow. Then you get the Taupo Fault Belt and out to the other side, another belt, a bit more subdued of uh, geothermal activity. You can also see that the geothermal activity sort of lines up with some of these across strike breaks in the rift segments, some of these accommodation zones, if you like. Um, as well, on this image, uh, some dots, these white ones, are silicic vents that have been mapped out that are less than 61,000 years old. There are some orange ones that are andesitic, um, and on this there might be the occasional, uh, no, I haven't shown a day site one in there, it's a bit further to the south, but there is basalt in the little squares, and where these basalt squares are linked, this is where we know we've had um, a dike intrusion. So we've got three different types of magmatism and volcanism going on here. We've got basalt, which isn't very common at the surface, but it must be common at depth because this place is chucking out the heat, equivalent to what you'd see on, um, in Iceland, for example. Um, we're predominantly rhyolitic in the central part of the Topol volcanic zone and andesitic to the north and the south and the most of the geothermal activity coincides with the zone of rhyolitic volcanism. And a little bit later, I'll show you a little profile through there. This is showing you that heat output and chloride concentration across the TVZ from the northwest to the southeast, showing you those two belts of heat. If you move forward and have a look, have a think about a paper that Stuart Simmons put out a while ago, he, was, he did some sampling with Kevin Brown um, uh, of getting into some of the geothermal wells in the area for the producing geothermal systems and could sample the deep hydrothermal fluid in these systems and look at the metal content. And you can see here he's showing on the left hand side gold and silver and copper and tellurium. And what you can see is that there are some kind of big circles in these zones and through here, um, proximal to uh, Lake Topol. And you might wonder why that is. And that's when I come back to this overall pattern, this localization of these geothermal systems. Um, on this image here and in, in, in the image on the right, you, you can see those fields where um, Stuart, has measured, Stuart and Kevin have measured some of the fluid. Here are the um, uh, kilograms per year that they're looking at in terms of uh, throughput of, of metals into these. You can see some have got quite high values and those that have got the high values are actually aligning with that intersection of the Hauraki Rift coming down here into the Topol volcanic zone on this margin in particular. Uh, also, some of these calderas, the boundaries of the calderas here, and also here, these sort of rhombic shapes uh, are, um, are influenced by some of these cross structures that have been recognized through, uh, through the um, Topol volcanic zone. So heat and mass transfer, silicic um, throughput as well as uh, hydrothermal throughput is being influenced in, uh, by deep structures. If you take a, I'm just gonna jump across here on this profile and just show you a composite of what those magmatic systems look like in depth and what these heat transfer systems are like um, so that we can jump into the reservoir scale controls. This is a composite picture. It looks a bit complex, but I'll just work you through it. It's, it's a total cartoon. It's interpreted from geological and geophysical data. Up on the top here, um, what you can see is a, 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 an exaggerated uh, topographic profile showing you coming from the northwest to the southeast, coming into the rift here, and the rift axis is shown, climbing up that Pyroar fault, um, so this bit here is the fault belt, jumping down into that Topol Eparor Basin where we don't have many faults. The Kaingaroa fault mapped uh, on the previous images um, is shown here. That actually has about um, uh, three kilometres or so of vertical offset over through here. Um, underneath this uh, image, you can see that there's that heat flow showing you there, showing you the heat output in those two bands. 
if you jump down on this image, you're looking at the topography as it is, and then you're looking at what is effectively a three layer section. Right down here below 15 kilometers depth, we have a mafic heavily intruded lower crust. And on the right hand side, according to the resistivity data, MT data, a highly conductive zone. Above that through to about 10 kilometers depth, there is a hot zone. This is quartzofeldspathic crust. That hot zone is biased to the right hand side um, given the heat output, um, there is some evidence in terms of seismic data uh, for uh, cooled intrusions in through here, but when I say cooled, they are just cooled below um, the solidus. And then up into this brittle upper crust where we've got frictional behavior, we've got the fault belt here schematically shown in through here. Um, we've got, we know where the basement cover contact is on the left and the right hand side of this because we, we've picked it up in drill holes. When we jump into the Repuro Basin, the uh, basement has been intercepted at about three kilometres deep in places, but we really don't know what happens to it over here underneath the rift. It's, it hasn't been picked and it can't be distinguished on the basis of its gravity signature. But there'll be a cover sequence over basement and in this region here, where we're going to look at in a bit more detail, that cover sequence of uh, intercalated lavas, rhyolites, andesites more predominant at depth, lots of pyroclastic material and reworked pyroclastic material and lake sediments forming a, a crudely layered cover sequence over this meta, uh, slightly metamorphosed basement environment. Um, occasionally, of course, some of this um, material from this uh, lower zone makes it through to the upper part of the, of the crust here via diking. Uh, most of that diking does not get to the surface. Most dikes are trapped and they feed, uh, they're trapped in this hot zone here and they're feeding the heat uh, and causing crust and melting there. Sometimes they might get higher up and sometimes presumably they would form some sort of sills there that might be driving some of this fluid flow. If we zoom in here and have a look at what uh, this part looks like, this is our reservoir scale controls. And we're going to see what, what that's uh, looking like. And before we do, I just want to uh, mention briefly um, how we think about fluid flow in a geothermal system. And um, this is a nice little diagram uh, that my uh, doctoral student Irene Wallace created that just illustrates um, geothermal conceptual models for geothermal systems. And in A, you, what you're looking at here are isotherms, so lines of equal temperature. And if you see them sort of horizontally positioned like this, if you can measure the temperature gradient, this would be a conductive heat transfer example. But as soon as you get those isotherms starting to change shape like this, um, and you're getting them to converge and to uh, rotate, what you're getting there is an indication of fluid flow. And in this case, this would be an example of not having very much uh, cover sequence, having a fault, a strongly focused uh, plume coming up a fault, and then maybe some outflow underneath uh, some sort of clay uh, aqua aquatide at the surface. If you have a little bit more uh, distributed permeability in here, uh, not so tightly focused by low permeability rocks, maybe a dome, maybe a fault. You might have something semi-focused, there's your outflow, um, but, but not as tightly focused as we have in B. This is probably a bit more like the total volcanic zone systems. This one here is probably a bit more like what the systems were uh, that produced the Hauraki Goldfield um, deposits. And then over here would be completely unconstrained. I'm also showing you this picture here out of Dave Reese's recent paper in um, our reviews in, um, in economic geology, a volume that's just come out on applied uh, structural geology of all forming hydrothermal deposits. And why I want to show you this, it, it's, it's, it's similar, but it's showing you the concept that um, Stuart Simmons and I brought out of our 2012 paper, where you have that brittle ductile transition, you have a basement, um, and then a cover sequence, and fluid is feeding in, in through this feed zone here at depth. You get a mineralization zone that might extend down to about a thousand meters, um, and then a discharge zone at the top. And, and I just wanted to show this one because Dave emphasizes the presence of the water table. And of course, 
above the water table, you're getting uh, vadozone, you're getting gases coming off these upwelling geothermal fluids, mixing with groundwater, forming acid, uh, acid acidic fluids that are forming acid sulfate alteration above the water table and below the water table, you're getting silicification um, and uh, you get a, a clay alteration on the margins that's temperature dependent forming your um, hydrothermal footprint. If we now jump in and spend uh, the rest, the next 10 minutes or so looking at examples, I, I want to start with the classic one, Broadlands or Harkey. And, and here's this little map here showing you where these geothermal systems are. Broadlands or Harkey is right on the eastern margin of the Topol volcanic zone, and it straddles some of the faults here speculatively shown on this image, um, that downfault in uh, to, the north, uh, to the northwest. And, and what you're looking at is a section that's been developed based on drill holes, uh, drill hole stratigraphy uh, cores and cuttings. And on the side here, um, Stuart has developed this um, boiling point for depth profile and um, temperature against uh, depth. And you can see those contours, those isotherms showing you upflow zones, one here, uh, isotherm in red, one here. Drill holes with feed zones shown in boxes, big feed zones, little feed zones rather randomly um, distributed through this uh, cover sequence and a couple of faults that we know about in the vicinity of this feed zone. Uh, one of the nice pieces of work that S uh, Simmons and Brown did in 2000 was to look at all of the data available from about 50 drill holes and map it out on um, plan view at different depths and we're going to take a look at that in a minute. Um, I guess from a physical perspective you could break you could break this uh, um, stratigraphic section up into three parts. You could break it up into the metasedimentary basement, where you have its tight, low permeability, fluid flow requires fractures, into this cover sequence that's mostly weak, low cohesion, very porous, and I think of that as the sponge. And then at the top, these lake sediments and tufts that form the aquitard that are resisting the fluid getting out at the surface. But let's look at the data um, Stuart brought together, and I'm just showing you the 500 meter plan view here. And what you can see um, are contours of temperature. And at this particular depth, you get boiling when the temperature is above 240 degrees Celsius. Um, and you can see the position of the uh, fault zone here, you're getting boiling in there. Uh, at the same depth, you're looking at quartz abundance, and quartz abundance increases in proximity proximity to these upflow zones, and then looking at clay abundance, which sits on top of the shoulders of these upflow zones. And of course, um, not just quartz abundance, but agillaria increases in here as well. Um, and so this paper gives a really nice example of um, the big large scale alteration footprint that develops around these geothermal systems, remembering that most of the fluid flow here is, is quite distributed. So you could think of um, this as a first order example of uh, an end member hydrological situation in um, a geothermal system. And I think of it as the cow's udder. So you might have a fairly constrained fluid flow through fractures in the basement. This is this feed zone in red coming up into the cover sequence, the sponge where the fluid will uh, go wherever it wants on long, tortuous, flow paths moving at a, with a, um, in, in a unit that has a, a, in, in, um, a sequence that has a sufficient permeability to just allow convection. Maybe faults here have sealed up or are um, of no consequence or might actually form baffles to a cross-strike flow. You could get slightly different chemistry on one side of a fault to another, so you might get compartmentalization. And you'll get deposition of um, uh, or silicification in, in the upflow zone, especially up in the top thousand meters or so. And then a clay front forming around the outside of this um, uh, that's temp temperature dependent. And also, of course, um, acid sulfate alteration forming um, a clay zone right at the very top. To get that fluid out, you might have to have some sort of hole developed through that aquitard. And typical holes will be old hot springs. You might have a fault that might bleed the fluid off, but the hot, spring, uh, hot springs form very nice pipes that get you through that aqu aquitard 
and allow bleeding off of some of that fluid into, into hot springs. So that's the quasi steady state hydrothermal scenario. Um, what uh, has been done though, and uh, that was exciting about Ohaki uh, Boardlands was the, uh, the recognition by um, Kevin Brown and others that um, a geothermal well going into the system is a short circuit and it allows for very, very high flux flow, decompression boiling, the fluid speeds up to the surface, and then you get something that is analogous to an epithermal vein. So there's flashing in the pipe, uh, getting platy calcite um, drops out, completely gums up the, um, the pipe, and then up near the top where you're having a pressure drop on a back pressure plate, you get chalcopyrite with um, uh, all grade deposits of gold and silver, and then downstream into uh, the weir box, you get classic um, crustiform coliform banded veins. So a very nice example of what happens when you have a short, sharp, short circuit in the system. And we've got examples of that happening naturally in the total volcanic zone. I'm going to start with this one, which is uh, Waimangu. So here is Tarawera volcano. This is the Okataina, uh, sometimes called Haroharo caldera. Uh, these little splotches show you the site of the uh, pink and white terraces that were destroyed in, on the 10th of June, 1886, uh, Lake Rotamahana and through here. Uh, this area is just up uh, in, the, in this zone here, Waimangu, and here uh, Tarawera shown on that DEM image, Okataina um, caldera. Um, so there was a geothermal system here prior to 1886 to produce these rather magnificent um, uh, uh, pink and white terraces, and of course they were destroyed by eruption. And in the aftermath of the eruption, which started here, and you can see the, the, the rent through Tarawera, and it, it, it exploded in this direction, dike-fed eruption, uh, blew out the ancestral lake that, um, prior to this lake here, and um, created um, um, well, it temporarily destroyed the geothermal system. It created incredible permeability that allowed uh, cold water to swamp the um, upflow zones of the geothermal system. But over time, the geothermal system re-established itself. And it, it did this rather spectacularly in 1901 and 1904 with the development of the Waimangu geyser. And that would have been from this sort of vicinity in through here. And these obviously, as uh, Stuart would always say this joke, these must be the geochemists running towards it. These must be the geophysicists, the structural geologist has got the good sense to take the photograph. And um, interestingly, this flat that these people are running across is Frying Pan Lake. Now that blew out in a major hydrothermal eruption in 1917, as the system was starting to replenish itself. Currently, this is producing geothermal uh, fluid at about the um, rate that you get out of a producing geothermal well. When um, Stuart looks at this, he thinks of this as the, the excellent analog for uh, potential vein formation at depth. When you think of that in the context of an image like this, um, we've got that large footprint forming from that long time frame uh, hydrology that I talked about before. But here we have a situation where you have a dike. In the case of Tarawera, it came right through to the surface. But if you have a dike stalling, and most of them do, there is a zone of very high strain above it, and you can get very focused fluid flow and gaping fractures. So this would be a, an excellent way to mimic a geothermal well in nature. And that would be an episode of high heat mass transfer over very short time frames. Another example of what that might look like is from Afar in Ethiopia, where I was lucky enough to go after a major rifting episode. And here you're looking at a basalt field in Afar, and there was a dike that intruded just underneath these fractures. It wouldn't have been more than a kilometre deep, that dike. And these fractures here, just for reference, these are little circles here are animal shelters. They're about three metres across. This is what permeability looks like in basalt above uh, a brand new dike that could focus some flow. Uh, I want to touch on Waiatapu, and um, that's located in this region here. Now, this is the 30 ohm meter contour. 
And that 30 ohm meter contour captures the Waimanga geothermal system that I just showed you. It captures Waiatapu and also Reporoa to the south. If you imagine this as representing the hydrothermal footprint at about 500 meters deep, you are looking at an incredibly large footprint, over 100 square kilometers of footprint that you would be exploring in. Um, I want to show you this image of Waiatapu because I love it, taken from the air. Here you can see Champagne Pool. This is the upflow. This is the, the, the geothermal waters coming up, depositing silica sinter around this hydrothermal vent that was produced at about the same time as the eruption that actually formed the, uh, the mountain of Tarawera um, about 700 years ago that was then in 1886 punched by a basalt dike. Uh, so th there's some evidence to suggest that this hydrothermal vent is associated with the, the um, 700 year old eruption of the actual Tarawera massif. Now around it, you can see all this broken rotten ground that's the acid sulfate alteration above the water table. So this water here is coming up high, but here the water table is actually below this level. And you can tell that because of all the rotten ground from the acid sulfate alteration. I've got this little diagram in here just to show you a close up of the Waiatapu area. These gray scales are those uh, resistivity contours, the 30 ohm meter one here in light gray. And um, I want to show it to you because Reporoa is a caldera. And that's a caldera margin through there. You can just see it out here. You're actually, in this photo here, you're actually looking south. And that's the caldera boundary in through there. So um, Waiatapu is one of the examples where you're actually transecting a, um, an old caldera. And some of these hydrothermal events uh, are, are proximal to that. Champagne Pool itself is 700 years old, as I said. 60 meters across, 60 meters deep. Um, based on the stratigraphy of erupted material, it probably um, is, uh, the eruption was probably around about anything from 170 to 350 meters below the surface. Um, spectacularly, these orange precipitates, as I showed you in the first slide, um, uh, contain gold and silver. And that's partly due to the conditions of the, this pool being um, have, having a lot of carbon dioxide in it, that maintains a temperature of about 74 degrees, it's weakly acidic, um, this stabilizes the precipitation of amorph amorphous arsenic and antimony sulfur colloids, which are very effective in absorbing uh, gold and silver from solution. So that's a hydrothermal eruption vent. Here are a few more. This is Rotokawa down here in this part of, of the um, geothermal area. And um, this is a little sketch map of it. Rotokawa has got a lake here on the shores of the lake. There are silicious, muddy um, deposits that contain gold and silver. But the key thing I want you to take away from this are these stars. Each of them represents the location of a hydrothermal eruption vent. And these have been determined by mapping out the clasts from the ejecta. Now, some of the ejecta from these deposits can be matched with the stratigraphy. And the largest of these um, was actually uh, erupted from uh, at least 450 meters below the surface. So I've just put this little sketch here of stratigraphy. The top 1500 meters are rhyolites and pyroclastic units and a bit of lake sediment at the top, the aquitard. Then you're on top of a whole thick sequence of andesites, which sits on a gray wacky basement. So these hydrothermal eruption vents uh, pretty big beasts as, when it comes to eruption vents, initiating over 450 metres below the surface. And guess what's there? A fault, a central field fault in the Rotokawa geothermal system. And if you project these down about 500 metres, you will intercept that fault. And of course, they're all beautifully aligned. So this is an example where I would argue that there's an interplay between faulting and development of hydrothermal eruptions. And these vents create very nice pipes for fluid flow at the surface. So putting that into another example of how to create uh, or mimic a geothermal well, you can have a fault developing here that breaches this um, otherwise uh, quietly um, uh, tortuous hydro hydrological system here forming this footprint of the system. Get a fault breaking through here, you have a moment of madness, sucks the fluid into that permeability um, uh, structure, produces a hydrothermal eruption at the surface. And again, 
you've got high heat and mass transfer over a short period of time. So um, just drawing all of that together into a summary, um, the type of volcanic zone, I think, is an excellent analog for epithermal vein deposits in many respects. Um, I think it gives you really good insight into the impacts of uh, those fundamental structural controls I talked about, uh, tectonic segmentation, the importance of inherited basement structures in localizing geothermal systems. Um, we have the example of the geothermal well that gives us very good insight into what happens when you change the hydrology from something that is effectively sponge-like to something that uh, creates a short circuit in the system and allows you to have very high um, uh, transfer of fluids and mass over a very short time frame. And the intriguing thing about that is even if you have got sufficient permeability in the geothermal plume as a whole to have convection going on, um, and, and uh, even quite, quite good permeability. If you put better permeability in because of a fault, you will transiently suck that fluid into alignment. So even on something like a, I don't know, a, 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 a non-vein style deposit, you might still have streaks of, of uh, enrichment because occasionally there have been episodes that have focused that fluid into um, structural alignment. Um, I also think we get insight into the controls on fluid flow in those different parts of what I would call a geothermal system, that deep feed zone, the epithermal mineralization zone, and the discharge zone. And, and for me, um, it's thinking about those two end member hydrologies and how and if they're connected, because the big footprint is one thing, but you can have short circuits anywhere within that footprint. And it's a matter of trying to... to um, narrow down the options for where those high flux zones would be. And um, I'm sure there's a few questions there I can see, so I will stop there. Thank you so much, JR, for your really interesting talk. Um, and you're right, there are quite a few questions popping up. Um, in the Q&A box. So um, again, to the audience, please uh, submit your questions and also upvote some of the other questions that you might see um, already in the box. Uh, so just to start off uh, with the first question. Uh, so do you have any estimate of fluid flow rates and or mass transfer rates in this system? Yes. Um, and I can't remember all the details off the top of my head, but I would refer you um, to the paper I wrote with Stuart Simmons in 2012 in Economic Geology. Um, I mean, Stuart has done some back of the envelope calculations combined with his metal um, uh, concentration data from the deep geothermal uh, fluids. And you could, you could build a system, a, a, a Rutakawa could be producing a gold deposit in less than 50,000 years, given the fluid flux and the, and the um, metal rates, uh, metal uh, concentrations. Um, as a bit of a follow-up, I think, question to that um, about conductive versus convective heat transfer in the system. Um, does it become more conductive within the cover rocks if they have enhanced permeability with respect to the basement? Yeah. So um, convection in the cover rocks, well, convection is, uh, is predom the predominant form of heat transfer above the brittle ductile transition. So that includes both the basement rocks, which are relatively tight, and the cover rocks. But that's a, that's a bulk view. If you really start to look in detail, you will start, as the geothermal explorers do, and operators, they really need to know this stuff. So if you start to look at some of their um, uh, temperature data, log data, you will see that there are places in the stratigraphy where they might be uh, exploring where you might have a conductive profile in a particular unit and a convective profile elsewhere. And that's totally related to the permeability of that unit. And so, for example, if you have uh, an aqua tard coming in, you'll end up going, in, like, for example, the clay cap, you'll start to be in a conductive regime. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, there's another question here. Um, JR, in your composite section inferred from geological and geophysical data, did the deep mafic rocks deform in a brittle 
brittle ductile or ductile manner. Uh, for example, is there a second deeper ductile to brittle ductile transition? I see an answer yeah, that first as a follow-up question, but I'll save oh, that for who, later. <laughs> who asked that question? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of debate on the position of the uh, moho in, in this area. There are two schools of thought. One school of thought thinks it's um, 30 kilometers deep in that zone that I was talking about. That deep mafic zone is um, heavily intruded um, crust, and I probably think like that. Others would put the moho at that 15 kilometer zone and everything below it is um, a stenosphere really. So um, there's some debates about that. In terms of the behavior of it, it, I mean, it's high temperature down there. So it's going to be behaving in a, um, in a ductile way. But you, as, you, as I'm sure you know, if you start moving magma really fast, you're gonna create um, fracture controlled pathways. And that's a function of the strain rate. So um, once things are on the move, you might be able to fracture something that would otherwise be ductile. And that's going to relate to the processes of magma, magma propagation. Right. So, yeah, I guess you're just talking about like the, the faults and the, the question, follow-up question here was, do you see any relationship between the location of the ductile shear zones or faults in this deep mafic crust, upper crust? Ah, but yeah, okay. So, no, because the resolution's not there. Um, but what you do see is the localization of the volcanic deposits in terms of the vents at the surface, which is why I showed you those silicic vents. Um, you've also, I mean, this is a, this is, this is a pretty intriguing area. Um, you can have, if, if, if you know the literature there, you'll know about the rhyolites and um, flare-ups. I mean, there are probably that whole tip topo reparo basin where the predominant amount of the geothermal uh, systems are that could constitute a single hot zone that would be of a similar scale to what existed a little bit to the west maybe 220 240,000 years ago that produced a whole series of eruptions big eruptions 100 cubic kilometer plus magma output eruptions coming through that system so, um, yeah, I don't know the answer. I can't give you any more answer than that. Although I, I would say that um, one intriguing thing about the geothermal systems is they rather ignore the volcanism. So, for example, um, major eruptions out of Topol Caldera, just next door to the Wairaki geothermal system, didn't seem to do much. The Wairaki geothermal system just trucked along. And likewise, um, that 1886 little basalt eruption through Okataina, yeah, little blip in the system, but it reset itself very quickly. And the point is, the inertia in the hyd hydrology, the hydrological uh, system, or the, the hydrothermal system, I should say, the inertia in the hydrothermal system is huge. And the volcanic stuff is just kind of like punching through it, and then the hydrothermal system's resetting. Great. Um, there's a, I can see people are using the upvote function, which is great. Um, so uh, there's another question here. Uh, is there is there VP data suggesting uh, the petrological moho depth? Well, that's the area of debate. So um, there are two schools of thought, Tim Stern and uh, co-authors and Harrison and White. And they, they debate that. There is a change in the VP, um, but... It, the question is what you're going to interpret um, that mafic zone as. I think it's not quite, the, the VP is not quite as high as you would normally expect for a stenosphere. Right. Okay. Um, so we have a question. Uh, all right. <laughs> Lots of questions coming in. It's a very interesting talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, here, uh, so vertical sections show hydrothermal fluids originated below Grey Wacky. What is the rocks below? What is the rock oh, yeah, below yeah. the Grey Wacky basement rocks, and how thick yeah. is the basement Grey Wacky? Yeah. Um, this is well. I you know I don't know how thick the Grey Wacky basement is. That's what we've got. <laughs> um, 
that's pretty much it for New Zealand. Once you get below the grey wacky, you're you're into um, the mantle. So because um, we're just we're just an accretionary wedge. This part of, of the country is just an accret. The basement is just an accretionary wedge that was um, bulldozed onto the margin of Gondwana. So um, there's not much else other than grey wacky in this part of the country. Um, the depths, well, we drill into grey wacky at 3k depth. Um, in the geothermal areas, uh, shallower in some, but that's about the deepest. And that means that's quite a thick sequence of cover. Um, and then you'd go down to uh, getting into um, probably melt in a very complex, heterogeneous, intruded mid crust, lots of silicic melts in there, partial melt, um, a typical mesh zone. Uh, and then down into that mafic intrusion. So it's it's I, it's grey wacky that has kind of been mucked up by intrusion of more mafic material from depth in the mid crust and crustal melting to form silicic rhyolitic material. Right. Awesome. Um, so our next question is uh, in the depth zonation of minerals depicted in several slides. Um, the uh, potassium feldspar shows only a minimal uh, overlap with that of gold. Yet in many or most bon bonanza gold vein systems, adularia is directly associated with gold in the veins. C uh, do you care to speculate on why this apparent spe separation exists at Taupo? Um, I'm not sure I showed a lot of detail on that. Um, I think the Borden Zohaki work is the one I'm familiar with. Um, actually, Isabel Shamberfort would probably have a lot more up-to-date information on that, but um, in the work that Stuart did based on Patrick Brown's data, um, Adularia certainly is prevalent in the high upflow parts of the system, so I don't see it as being absent, and the thing about the, the difficulty here is that there's not a heck of a lot of gold deposited in the TVZ, and no one's asked me that question, where's the gold, where are the veins? I, don't, I haven't found them yet. I mean, in the in the um, Ohaki Broadland system, there are minor amounts of gold disseminated throughout the deposit, but absolutely sub-economic. And we have not found vein style epithermal epithermal veins uh, of any any real um, import in the TVZ to date. Right. Okay. So there's a, a question that kind of goes on the same vein as that, but um, what is the uh, optimum condition for the formation of the epithermal veins? Well, almost, but not quite the TVZ, I would say, because we don't have the veins there, but we have a lot of geothermal activity and we have done a lot of drilling in those geothermal areas. I mm -hmm. would say it's not, it, it's possible that there are deposits in the TVZ. But um, what the question I would then put to myself is, what's the difference between the Topol Volcanic Zone and the Hauraki Goldfields up to the northwest? And one of the key differences is the depth to basement. So in the TVZ, the basement and where these geothermal systems are goes, you know, it's, it's up to 3K deep, maybe more in places. That's a big, thick cover sequence that is perfect for geothermal exploration. You don't get better for geothermal exploration because you, you've got so much permeability, so much potential for um, fluid flow in that sponge. Up in the Hauraki Goldfields, the depth to basement will have been a lot less um, at, because the rifting wasn't as, as much, the, the basin fill is not as great. So maybe that's one fundamental control is that you don't want basins that are too thick if you want really um, nice vein deposits. You need, you need good high strokes. All right, good, interesting. So um, there's another question here. Uh, so is it possible that the mineralization uh, is controlled um, by the azimuth of a fault or shear zone on the surface? Um, where's that one? Which was that one? I'm just trying to um, figure what's at the top of the... I think that's uh, it's in the chat to the panelists to the hosts. Is it possible mineralization control the azimuth fault? 
shear zone on the surface. Well, um, again, I will. Get, you know, it's hard to tell with topal volcanic zone because you're not seeing a lot of gold mineralization. What you're seeing is moving fluid. Um, and I would say that the localization of the high flux systems in the, in the topal volcanic zone are influenced by that structural segmentation. So the, um, they're, they're either on the, on at, towards the tips of big normal fault systems and those tips of the normal fault systems are where you have cross, uh, cross rift structures. So in that sort of accommodation zone area. Not always, but, um, but sometimes, a lot of the time. If you then jump up to the Hauraki gold fields, uh, I would say absolutely you start to see in more detail the relationship between faults and the epithermal deposits. And there you can start to um, hazard a guess at some of those relationships about which structures might be more favorable or not. And again, I would suggest that some of those uh, accommodation zone cross structures um, uh, have a role to play. So where you have the interception between two different styles of faulting, corners. Corners are very interesting. All right. Um, we have another question uh, here. So uh, this person's curious about your comment that topo magmatism is decoupled from the geothermal system. Is there a relationship between the geothermal systems and other styles of magmatism, such as minor, Fair, fair yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the geothermal systems are decoupled in the sense that they are a little bit immune to the shenanigans of the volcanic systems. So, I mean, you need the magma for the heat. So uh, absolutely, they're related to the fact that there is magmatism at depth. Um, do they need, does a geothermal system need to be pinned to a specific pluton at depth? I don't think so. There's enough heat coming into the system that it pretty much acts like a hot plate. So, um, so yes, in the sense, magma is absolutely important. Um, but as I said, the geothermal systems don't care if a dike's punched through them. They'll just reset. They don't really care if there's a super eruption happening a little bit down the road. They'll, they'll reset. Um, but absolutely, where the geothermal systems are, if you punch a, a dike through into one, as happened in 1886, yes, you'll generate phreatomagmatic um, eruptions. Interesting. All right, so it looks like we are on our last question. Um, so this is prefaced as a random question, but <laughs> sounds like fun. Um, what could be the relationship in the genesis of epithermal systems and IOCG deposits? Uh, Eduardo, you can't ask me that. Eduardo is about to start a PhD on this very topic. Eduardo, you oh. are going to answer that. That's very sneaky. Oh, Duncan Proctor would like to answer this question live. Duncan Proctor, where are you? I, I think he's just clearing the question. I just cleared it out. Duncan, if you want to answer it, open up your mic. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I think that oh, brings us, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that brings us to the, um, well, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I think everyone was really, um, like, really intrigued throughout it all. Um, so uh, just as a reminder to everyone, um, JR and Ross also have um, other talks that are uh, like they're prepared to give. So if you're um, interested in reaching out to them to have them speak it with your student chapter, um, please uh, see their site on the SEG website. Um, all right, so I think, are we still on your... Um, yeah, yeah all right. about to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just have a couple more, um, I guess, just like uh, slides about upcoming events and everything. Uh, but again, I just want to thank all of our uh, speakers. Uh, I think, JR, you're the last one standing with us right now. But thank you again for sharing with us your time and your passion for um, your research. And uh, thank you also to the attendees for participating um, uh, and showing interest in our event. 
So uh, as a special, uh, as a, as a, just a reminder as well, we have a survey uh, that we will be, uh, I believe will be sent out uh, to all the attendees. So uh, if you could be sure to fill that out, that would be really helpful for us so that we could create more events uh, that spark your interest in the future. Um, Again, yeah, if you're interested in having one of these lectures at your group, please reach out to them uh, and look at their uh, the other topics uh, on this website. Um, next slide. I think. Yeah, so just I want to give a brief summary uh, of some upcoming, uh, exciting upcoming SCG events. Uh, so as Mike Venter had mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have the SCG 100 conference, uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity because I don't, I don't know if we'll be anyone, any of us will be around for 200. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you guys are interested in that, please register uh, online. And we also have the Science of Minerals Exploration course. That's a two-day course. That's three hours, uh, three hours each day. Um, that introduces participants to the disciplines of economic geology, focusing on several key areas of importance, including mineral resources within modern society, uh, the processes by which mineral deposits are formed in the Earth's crust, how exploration geologists uh, discover ore deposits, and how mineral resources are evaluated to become economically important mines. Um, sounds pretty interesting, and it's led by uh, Bill Chavez and Roberto Xavier. Um, and then we also have the Exploration Decision Making course. So this is an intensive two-day course that will examine exploration decision making with a focus on junior exploration companies and their evolution through commodity and project cycles. Um, so this is a great opportunity to learn about the economic side of the project management from uh, world experts Mike Doggett and Ken, Ken Lay. And then lastly, we have our final installment of the popular critical mineral series um, that will be discussing how industry can build more resilient supply chains by planning for reuse uh, and recycling. So a look toward the future of the mining value chain. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So the SEG is dedicated to advancing the science of economic geology and offers incredible benefits to its members, such mm -hmm. as conferences, field trips, short courses, workshops, publications, and mentoring. Uh, so if you are not yet a member, please visit the webpage to learn more about uh, these opportunities. Uh, so this concludes our traveling lecture symposium. I want to thank again our panelists and for the great discussions and everyone for attending today's webinar. As you leave, please complete the survey. Uh, we'll use your input again to create and design future events. Um, as a reminder, uh, an archive of today's presentation will be available, I believe, within ne the next 24 hours. Um, so that will be on the SCG website and its YouTube channel. So uh, thank you, everyone. And please have a nice morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are um, in the world. So thank you.